Okay, listen up. Our target is Tama Rayati. I'm sure most of you know who I'm talking about. This ha- this man has become something of a legend in the underworld. In the underworld, pushers, gangs, killers, they all respect him like a god. For the past ten years, his building has been a no-go zone for police. I don't care how big he is or who is behind him. He must be stopped. That enterprising fuck's been renting out rooms like it's an apartment to any little life piece of shit looking to keep his head down. Our mission is simple. We go in and we take him out. Mm. Is it the Raid 2? You are very, very, very close. It's not the Raid Redemption, is it? It is the Raid Redemption. Oh. You know, I went with 2 just because we've done uh, Raid Redemption on the show, so... Ah. Season 3, Episode 17 of the Average Joe's Movie Clip Cast. This is Justin. And I'm Joey. In this episode, we'll be chatting about one of those key movies for cinephiles growing up in the 90s. I'm talking about none other than Quentin Tarantino's iconic Pulp Fiction from 1994. Plus, it's hot out here to be a pip, so we're going to cool down and chat about Hustle and Flow from 2005. I do believe it's hard out here for a pimp, but, you know, I digress. Anywho, we do discuss uh, all of our full thoughts on films, so if you haven't seen Pulp Fiction somehow, and you don't want to be spoiled, and if you haven't, you definitely don't want to be spoiled, please, skip ahead. Actually, pause this, go watch it, come back. Um, and if you haven't seen Hustle and Flow, which I hadn't until today... I mean, hey, pause that, go watch that, come back, listen to it, she'll be good to go. And if you want to be a part of the movie Clubcast, make sure to hit subscribe, join us on, is it still Buzzsprout? No, we actually just switched up uh, to Anchor, so you can find us on Anchor, F- no, not Anchor, just Anchor, and there's mm-hmm. also, that we still has us on Apple, still should have us on Stitcher, Spotify, and of course, YouTube. Right on. So how are you doing? I'm doing pretty well, man. That was actually one of the things I was about to just talk about. So we got there. Um, I'm just uh, trying to save up some money and uh, planning planning a little uh, mini little trip for my birthday in about a month or so. It's your birthday? Where are you going? Uh, just to Charlotte, where you just left from. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's pro- right. You're... Talking about maybe getting some buddies to go to the old Carowinds. I don't think we're going to go to Carowinds. I think uh, my plan as of right now, and it may not come to fruition, but I want to go to, um, there's this Japanese restaurant. Um, So think like a hibachi mixed with a um, fondue place. So I'm strange. So you know how like hibachi they cook on the table for you and fondue you cook on the table yourself. Well, this is a Japanese restaurant where you, you cook on the table yourself. Oh, okay. Um, I only know fondue is a dip. I didn't even know they had anything to do with cooking yourself. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So like at a fondue restaurant, there is one down in Charleston, mm-hmm. um, and I don't remember what it's called, but the it it was pretty good. But the 
like the one that most people know in South Carolina is the melting pot um, down in Myrtle mm. Beach. I mean, Myrtle Beach. Um, <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, so it's down in Myrtle Beach. I mean, it has a very nice dress code. Um, and it's like a good date place. Like I took my baby mama there and my last serious girlfriend there. Both uh, both times it was well over 100 bucks. Um, mm-hmm. But you, it's a multiple course meal. Like you get um, the bread with the cheese like you were talking about to dip it in. They're uh, mm-hmm. like this really nice uh, salad that has like really special cheese and stuff on it. Like I want to say it never seen the light until it was brought to you. Some, you know, stuff like that. But then you get different kinds of meat and you cook them in the hot oil and then you get um like fruit to put in uh, melted chocolate mm-hmm. so okay. it's a fun time um so this japanese place i my my new boss is actually telling me about it i don't know a ton about it other than what he told me and a little bit of a little bit of googling that i did on it but it seems really cool like they give you different kinds of meat and you know tell you kind of how if you want to cook them different ways and there's like a little grill on the table and you just kind of hang out and so i think that would be fun and then the other thing, I mean, we're going to play Magic because we're nerds. And then I want to play uh, Don't Drink and Drive Mario Kart. Um, oh, what's and, that? And, and, oh, so it's a drinking game while that you play um, while playing Mario Kart. Mm-hmm. So obviously it's against the law to drink and drive. So mm-hmm. you can either be drinking or you can be racing, but you can't be doing the same both at the same time. So if you want to drink, you have to put your controller down. And if you want to drive, you have to put your drink down. Okay. Um, so I've only played it like once or twice. And the last time I played it, I played it on the SNES version. So that doesn't have like your leader shells or your bu- bullet bills or, you know, your three bread shells or, you know, all the different things that can help you catch back up and slingshot, you know, rubber bands you back to the front. Um, mm-hmm. But I'm going to employ the same strategy, which is when the race starts – the controller is on the table and my drink is in my hand and then I finish the drink and start driving where most people try to do a lap and then drink. I'm mm-hmm. just going to just, you know, take the 10 or 15 seconds or whatever it is at the beginning and just go from there. I'll probably be, if we get to do that, I'll probably be really messed up after maybe two cups. Mm-hmm. I, I don't mean like cups of drink. I mean like Mario Kart cups. Maybe less. I don't know. <laughs> just depends on a cups. <laughs> yeah, the special cup or the leaf cup or whatever the hell yeah. all those cups are in the new Mario the Kart. Beehive or, cup. Yeah, the eight million cup. So. Okay, so you have to have an empty drink in order to cross the finish have... line successfully. Well, you... yes, to cross the finish line successfully, your drink does have to be gone. All right. Yeah, we just got back from a little road trip up to Charlotte. A little uh, Great Wolf Lodge action and uh, Carowinds for the kid's birthday. So, yeah, some real good days up there. Gosh, it's it's nice to... The whole indoor water park is so convenient. It's kind of like the... Uh, we've been to the Great Wolf Lodge in Atlanta before, and it's a lot bigger. And so, like... This being like kind of a smaller facility, it kind of was like a Chuck E. Cheese that like there you can stay the night at essentially. So pretty wild, a lot of kids doing their thing. But um, you know, whenever you got a bunch of kids acting wild, the ones your your own kids acting wild don't um, seem to bother you quite as much. So yeah, we had a good old time up there and uh, went up to Carowinds first time in a while. That is the Cedar Point. Um, owned amusement park now it uh borders the south carolina north carolina border um actually used to be owned by what paramount so they used to have all those like paramount movie references like mm. top gun days of thunder but yeah now cedar point so yeah they go pretty roller coaster crazy there um majority of them were open uh a couple weren't but yeah we uh, rode the, the fury what 325 back to back and yeah that uh that stir up my motion sickness quite a bit so it's kind of hard it's kind of hard to recover from that at a, an amusement park <laughs> i was asking her i was like can you buy dramamine in the park and couldn't just like painkillers and they sold my doll but not not dramamine of course we had kids level dramamine in our uh, little bag but didn't realize that until afterwards but uh yeah 
good day, couple days, you know, out on the road, and then only had two days of work this week, and so yeah, it is a nice start to spring. Easter coming up, huh? Oh yeah, I guess I guess it is. That's not something I really keep up with, so yeah. Um, yeah, Easter is probably one of my lesser favorite holidays, just because I I've always kind of something about sunday has always rubbed me the wrong way so um easter being on sunday it's it's almost like a it's almost like a kick in the nuts for uh holidays because yeah you gotta dress up and go out if you're you know you're into that stuff and then you got work the next day so what the kind of kind of holiday is that but you know has a lot of re- religious context as we've spoke about on the show before with uh that's that's true um and i'm not gonna just go into fact dropping to uh to you whatever it's fine yes lots of religious significance to those that matter so yes yep so um and then yeah took a little break break from the diet to uh you know do the travel you know plenty of soda and fast food and crap on the road and surprisingly i was able to detox from that pretty quickly and so now i'm about 21 pounds down on my diet um, so yeah, feeling pretty good, pretty good. And, um, yeah, hopefully, um, be done with drink- drinking for a while now, maybe just on special occasions. Nice. No drunk Mario Kart in my immediate future. Well, I mean, I hardly ever drink, so. True. You know, I guess it's only, only oh. fair. Look at that. You're, you sound better when the mic's in front of your face. I just realized I was like, <laughs> the mic. I don't want to tell you what to do, Joey. You could have been like, hey, man, you sound fucking muffled. And I would have moved the mic. I didn't even really. It just kind of dawned on me. I was like, why the fuck is a mic way over there? So. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Let's talk some movies. What, what kind of trivia you got for me? All right. This is the Average Shows Movie Clubcast edition of trivia. I got three questions for you. All right. Um. So we're going to start at the bottom. All right. So from what year have we featured the most movies? Mm. And then bonus, if you can tell me how many from that year. Oh, geez. Hmm. That's a hard question. Uh, um, there's also, there was a two-way tie for second and like a three or four-way tie for third, but I don't remember... The years for third because I deleted them all, but I do have the two years that tied for second. Um, is it in the fifties? Like the number of movies, for, or, or from like the year? No, like the decade. No, they are all from when since we've been alive. All, all the top three years, but number one's what we're shooting for. Oh, okay. Um, hmm. What would be the top year? So let's see here. Robot and Frank, 2012. Oh, Which... you're just going to go through them all. <laughs> well, let me take a little gander, see if I can put something together here. There's two 2012s. Hmm. Am I onto something? There's there's two 2005s. There's a lot of movies here, Joey. Can't there there are. All. Yeah. Oh, trust <laughs> me. I know as I had to just go through and tag all the ones I was missing and uh-huh. I was missing like 30, 30 that weren't tagged or something like that. All right, I'll go with 2005. That is kind of close. It is 2008. Okay. And there are six movies from 2008. Second place, which was a two way tie, was 1994 and 2003, each with five movies. I did not write them down, so I don't remember which ones they are, but. <laughs> so. Thanks for going halfway uh, halfway there for us. Oh, well, you know, I had to make sure um, <laughs> that I had all the right numbers and I wasn't shortchanging us, so... Yeah, there you go. All right. Second question. How many movies from the Criterion Collection have we <laughs> featured on the show? And I don't mean we talked about in passing and, like, the good and the bad and the ugly. I mean, we featured... Main episodes. Oof, there's gonna be a few of them. There's gonna be should be mm-hmm. quite a few of them. Um, I'll say thirty. That is very close. Twenty-eight. Wow. Including Pulp Fiction, 
and from Russia, which are in the Laserdisc. Gotcha. Okay. Yep. All right. And we're going to do a throwback. All right. Back in Season 1, Episode 7, mm-hmm. we talked about Gangster Squad that starred Emma Stone and Ryan Gosling. Mm-hmm. This was the mm-hmm. second of the three times the duo have been an on-screen item. Can you name the other two? Well, it's La La Land and... Um... Uh, cra- is it Crazy Stupid Love? You got it, my friend. Nice. I knew something. You... D- I try. I mean, I know a lot, little, but you just this have this. A, you're like my kryptonite. I mean, I tried to make it where it wasn't like crazy random, and I think, like, this was about our show. It seemed real good, and I I have a, a theme <laughs> going on. Um, I mean, my quote threw us back to season one, episode three. That question threw us back to season one, episode seven. So you know. Oh. Okay. 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 All right, what else we've been watching? It's coming up now in the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> Okie doke. So, um, my categories are: so you say you're the best, epic team up, and catching up on a classic. Mm, there can be only one frat boy stupidity and I'll be right back frat boy's a bad word Joey why are you using such such language in my in my presence frotter <laughs> mm, 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 mm. you'll you'll see you'll right. see you'll understand well what's I'll be right back cause we're not going anywhere never ever no matter what you do, say, I'll be right back. Because you won't. Oh, Because you'll be five. dead. Scream, the requel. Um, oh, Jesus. <laughs> have, have, you, have you seen the requel? Yes, it's, it's, it's firmly faded from memory as well. <laughs> um, I mean, I thought it was pretty solid. It, it had a lot of homages back to the first one. Um... And it had that same, it was very meta, played on all the rules. It just, it didn't click as well as the first one or the fourth one. Uh, it's been a while since I've seen like two and three. So I probably have to rewatch, probably need to rewatch all of them, but one, honestly. But I Three's thought it was crap. fun. Three's the crap. one I've seen. I enjoy two. I remember enjoying two. But, I mean, it also has Timothy Oliphant and Sarah Michelle Gellar. Mm. So, you know, hey. But, you know, hell in that one, they even talk about what sequels are better than the first one. So, you know, it's a thing. Yep. Uh, watched all of those. So, yeah, I got reviews on all those. And, yeah, I really enjoyed four, surprisingly so. Um, one, of course. And then I would go to the newest one and then two and three. So. I think right now it'd probably have to be one and then four, then two, then five, then three. That would be my... But, like, I don't dislike any of them. I mean, Scream is, for a long time, was, like, the only horror movie that I really liked. So, yeah. All right. So, you say you're the best, huh? Yeah. So, um, I watched that uh, that Best Picture winner, that that CODA, that um, essentially kind of deaf awareness movie. Um, It is about this family in a fishing town. And the daughter is not deaf. So it's actually a pretty interesting look at how, like, deaf parents can be a little, you know, resentful toward their um, hearing child. Um, touches on that with some, some pretty good moments. Um, where Sound of Metal kind of hinted at, like, deaf awareness kind of throughout because it was about a guy going deaf. This one was more about, you know, just that struggle between, you know, being in a family um that's like that especially since they depend on her so much because she interprets for them um but it really didn't really touch into like what it's like to be deaf until the end um when it really kind of feeds into like what her passion is which is um music and singing which um you know they're somewhat resentful towards as well uh yeah so coda kind of a uh, happy feel good kind of movie for a best picture winner but i guess sometimes that's the route they they're gonna go. I wanted Jane Campion's um, 
Power of the Dog. I thought that was by far the best uh, nominee, but Academy saw it differently and went with uh, Coda, and uh, I enjoyed it. Pretty good show. By far not the, the my least favorite of the uh, 10 nominees, I believe it was. All right, I want to take a moment right here. So you're way more into the Oscars. Um, mm-hmm. I, try, I tried to watch, but... Um, and you tried to help me watch, but I wasn't in the same zip code as you. Um, so, okay. As someone who, like, you know, I enjoy movies. Um, I don't necessarily maybe enjoy the artsy movies as much as you and some other people, but mm-hmm. I do enjoy some of them. So, what happened to where things like, you know, even even we go back to the episode where we talked about the Oscars, where you had stuff like. Brokeback Mountain, which was very commercially successful, or mm-hmm. Social Network, um, even even like Crash, like that did pretty well at the theaters. Mm-hmm. Or you know, we go back to Pulp Fiction and Shawshank Redemption and uh, Forrest Gump or Silence of the Lambs or One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest or Godfather, mm-hmm. like these movies that were actual like commercial movies. Mm-hmm. And now we get these movies that literally just feel like they're being made to be Oscar movies. Or, you know, you might get a Black mm-hmm. Panther thrown in there because of Chadwick Boseman, um, unfortunately, or, you know, something like that. And it yeah. just it just feels like too many of the movies are just baity movies and they're not like doesn't I, I don't know. Like, it, it just feels like that the Oscars is they're becoming so full of themselves that, you know, they're, they're just, I, I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with this. It just feels okay. like for a com- a common movie person, why the fuck are they going to give any shits about the Oscars outside of Will Smith slapping Chris Rock? Like, <laughs> well, I, I mean, personally as a big Oscar fan, like I don't really need like, um, like the, majority of folks to like be interested i like i wish they would cater more towards movie lovers like you watch the red carpet show and it's like a bunch of like fashion experts like trying to talk about movies it's actually kind of embarrassing how kind of stiff and terrible they are it'd be kind of nice to maybe if they had some like critics or something out on the red carpet talking to people it'd be a little bit more appealing for me but you know they uh they're aiming for those tv numbers and those um you know they were actually kind of This was one of my lesser favorite Oscars like ever to watch because it seemed like they were kind of being kind of cynical towards movies in general. Um, Took me a second to pull up my list. So, yeah, let's let's quickly break down the uh, Best Picture nominees. So Nightmare Alley, uh, that was the Guillermo del Toro film. I that was my least favorite. I think it was nominated because he won for Shape of Water. And that's pretty much it. Okay, so Nightmare Alley. The only reason I even know that it's a thing is I didn't know the name until you said uh, Guillermo. Mm -hmm. Um, But if you would have just said Nightmare Alley and didn't say it was directed by Guillermo del Toro, no fucking clue what that movie is. Actually, I couldn't tell you what that movie's about. Obviously, Mm -hmm. it's going to be some sort of dark fantasy horror movie. But outside of that, I couldn't tell you anything about it. It's like a noir. It's a remake. So, Um, Then you got West Side Story. That was my uh, ninth pick. I mean... Steven Spielberg, remake of a Best Picture winner. Um, I mean, I'm kind of blanking on what I said about it, but I think for the most part, I think it really didn't really need to be remade other than to, you know, just do this updated, fresh take on it, which I mean, it was really very, happen. wasn't it like very close to the original? Um, in terms of what? Like, just overall, like, it was very... I mean, it's the same thing. It's just different actors, different director, different decade. Yes. So, Oh, so they did modernize it? So instead of being in, like, the 50s, it was now? I mean, no, no, no. It's It still takes t- place in kind of the same period. I mean, there's a part of the beginning where they kind of hit at the fact that, like, um, a lot of the low-income housing is getting, like, torn down in New York, but then they pretty much leave that in the beginning of the movie, and it goes into the direction that you um, would expect... Um, a lot of people weren't happy with the leads. Um, I mean, it had its moments, but it just, it, it was a very odd mix of the quirky style that musical is in a more, like, try, they tried to make it a little bit more serious, and I just didn't think that combination quite worked. Okay. 
Um, eight, my eighth pick was Dune. Um, enjoyed it. Uh, I mean, not that, as much that, as like Fellowship of the Ring or anything. Go ahead. I think that's the one that I've, I, at least until you, if you name something else, but that's the one that I had heard of and seen like advertisement and stuff for it, you know, like mm-hmm. on Paramount or Max or, or something, I guess, I guess maybe also some of it comes to is, you know, we don't watch TV the same way. There's not commercials 24 seven, Sure. Um, you know, like I'm on YouTube premium, so I don't have commercials on there. So maybe mm-hmm. that's something to it. But I mean, Dune was, you know, a movie I saw, you know, all over Letterboxd and I saw, um, you know, just being talked about in general. I even think I saw you say that it won too many awards, even though a lot of them were technical awards, as my memory serves. Yeah, it won like every single technical award to a point where it was just kind of getting silly. So I, I was getting tired of Dune winning like everything except for like stuff that, you know matters more so so i don't know All also opinions. we don't have we, we don't have to go through the the whole list if you don't want it so it's just more of it just something that, that i felt and maybe some other people are feeling like if they're no, trying it's a good conversation okay well you know i, I don't want us to be at eight hours <laughs> <laughs> sure sure uh so yeah i just talked about coda that was my seventh um king richard that's the uh, the will smith um biopic about the Williams, um, uh, the father, or the whole family about them, you know, becoming, uh, you know, tennis, um, you know, gods. Tennis royalty. Yeah, tennis royalty. Yeah. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Good sports flick. Um, you know, it kind of shows you these confusing choices that uh, the Richard guy made that uh, ended up being right in the end. And I've never been much of a Venus and Serena fan just because they were so dominant for so long and they were so aggressive and kind of seemed arrogant. But, I mean, this this definitely makes them, humanizes them and makes them, you know, sweet young girls just trying to make it up in the tennis world. So, yeah, it's a good show. I, um, I, I understand why you would necessarily, like, arrogance you know coming from being like a vikings fan where you know you don't win anything and being a gamecocks fan (laughs) where you only had like five good years um even though your fan base was arrogant as shit during those five years (laughs) you weren't necessarily but your fan base was which fan base is this now the gamecocks fan base we were arrogant we were uh, a lot, of, at least in Florence, and what I could see online, a lot of Carolina fans during the the five during the Spur years with Clowney and um, Lattimore, okay. and and then definitely started thinking they were like Alabama and like holding Alabama's cock or something. <laughs> um, so just, but that's neither here nor there. I just wanted to a, a fun little jab at you. Sorry there. Um, mm. So, uh, let's see. Drive my car was five. Um, that's the Japanese flick. Ended up winning best foreign language. Um, they've already announced it for Criterion. It's definitely a Criterion style kind of movie. Um, it's very slow burn, but ended up being all right. Um, you you really like the slow burn movies, so that's reasonable. <laughs> Not all of them. <laughs> I I said you really liked them. I didn't say you liked every single one. Geez, that would be like you trying to say Joey. You like you really like noirs. I'm like I don't like all noirs. Yeah, you do. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> oh man, PTA is a licorice pizza. You know it's pretty. Oh, that's that's one I did hear about, and I did see, and I think because of being in some of the movie groups I'm in, I saw some of that. That one actually does that and Dune do look interesting, and are on my list to watch. Dune with the Rock that that didn't get nominated. That oh came yeah, out a couple no. years ago. I mean, oh, I mean, they could remake that movie with The Rock now, and it probably would be a lot better. He just remake his own movie. Yeah. Um. Uh, got Kenneth Branagh as a uh, Belfast. Um, you know, a little Irish uh, family. You know, in the midst of a conflict, coming of age story, great style. Kenneth Branagh. Yeah. It was surprising. That was the last one I saw, and it ended up being a lot better than I thought. Uh, Thomas McKay's a. Uh, don't look up, which was the kind of the controversial um, selection because people thought it was condescending, but I thought it was quite that's hilarious. The, that's a Netflix movie with Leo and J Law. Yep. Okay. And then Power of the Dog, Jane Campion should have won. Um, not sure why I didn't. She won uh, Best Director. Okay, interesting. I know, and I know Will won Best Actor. Who ended up winning Best Actress? Oh. Uh, 
Wow, that's good. That's a good question. I'm blanking. Um, oh, it went to, uh, um, I think it's Jessica Chastain. She did. Um, that that sounds right now that you say it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, don't quote me on that. But yeah, she played at, like this televangelist wife or something. I think it is uh, like Tammy Faye or I don't know. Yeah, that, sound, that sounds right. But, I mean, some of those movies do sound interesting, but typically they just, they, they don't seem like, um, you know, your movies that, you know, mm-hmm. that are that are also commercially well. And I feel like, I'm not saying like every best-selling movie like, like needs to be nominated, but, you know, how, how is something like Spider-Man or when Avengers were out, not at least nominated, you know, they don't have to win, but like, yeah, you know, I didn't even particularly like Spider Man. I, I mean, I didn't dislike it, but I didn't think it was the greatest thing since sliced bread. Um, mm-hmm. But you know, when when you're starting talking about like one of the highest grossing movies in years, especially coming out of like the era that we're in, it's like how is that not at least considered? Um, or you know how they like they love biopics, especially about minorities, and they moved up to ten movies in what was it, 2015, 2016. Um, was the um, Straight Outta Compton, which wasn't even nominated. Like, sure. that actually... But, you know, again, I guess it's easy to armchair quarterback or whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah, so. there's definitely always some snubs. And, I mean, it's been a while now where the Oscars have kind of catered towards the movies that want to be Oscar winners. And a lot, I mean, a lot of it comes down to the um, campaigning that the different studios do. So, like... One Netflix movie might not get as much attention as another just because that's not the one they campaign for. So that's it's kind of a true. messed up system. But I mean, it's it's like the night for movies on TV. So I get invested. I, uh, I was watching like right around the Oscar came out. Um, I watch like, a lot of countdown things on YouTube and one of them is Watch Mojo. And yeah. they had a countdown of uh, like worst Oscar winners or West worst best Oscar picture movie. Oscar... Worst best picture winning Oscar movies. There we go. Jesus. And they, they were talking about um Shakespeare in Love, I believe, and how like uh Homeboy mm-hmm. who's in jail, uh Harvey fucking mm-hmm. like campaigned hard for it and so it stole it from whatever movie like that everyone thought was gonna win because just Saving because of how Ryan. Yeah, for how much it was um campaigned for. Yeah. Yep. Uh the Weinsteins I've heard definitely uh kind of change the game in terms of how the politics of the Academy Award works, unfortunately. So, Well, I mean, it's, it's still, I mean, like for us, it's still all in fun. Like, mm-hmm. um, and some, like I said, I do, I do really want to see licorice pizza. Um, you know, the few movies I've seen from PTA, I have enjoyed, um, Dune just seems like so massive and like it's going to be so, um, technically sound, especially visually and probably audibly, um, or out of, auditorily audibly um oral orally i don't know good sound got it yes yeah (laughs) i'm just trying to come up with the right word here auditorily (laughs) well it's your auditory and then i was like but auditorily is not right it's oral i think orally um look this is what this -hmm. is what happens i'm normally getting ready to go to bed now with my new job so you making a start this late this is your fault oh so um Fraternity boy stupidity. Mmm. 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 Good times. So this was one. It's uh, you can watch on Paramount, no less. You watch but... Good Times? Oh yes. No. This is where we learn all how to be jackasses forever. Oh. Okay. Yep. <laughs> See. <laughs> um. All right. So the movie's dumb as fuck. Like obviously. Actually, I don't even think I've watched a Jackass since the first movie. Maybe okay. I did. Me and me and Carl were talking about it. How they just, I, like, I don't remember if I'm watching the TV show or the movie or whatever. But I mean, there were some things that were hilarious, like a homeboy wearing a cup and getting punched in the dick by Francis Ngannou. Um, for those who don't know who Francis Ngannou is, he's the current reigning. I'm pretty sure he's still the current reigning and defending UFC heavyweight champion of the world. And I'm pretty sure they said he had the hardest recorded punch. Um, in history um, and he dented a metal cup and then you know homeboy stood there and got softball pitched and had his thighs all fucked up before they hit him in the mm. cup he took a hockey puck and a pogo stick mm. but probably the best thing the best thing in that whole movie 
was Machine Gun Kelly getting slapped off of, off of a bike into water. That was the best thing that happened because, well, he deserved more. Um, <laughs> so, but yeah, no, it's just stupid. Like, turn your brain off. Like, we were watching Ink Master, and they threw a commercial up for it um, because the person that's letting us borrow that has that one that's ads in it. And, I mean, they're letting me steal it from them, so I can't say anything. Um, and I was just like, yo, let's watch that. And he was like, yeah, sure. And we watched it. I mean, we laughed the whole time, but boy, is it dumb as hell. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I never saw uh, part three, but eventually I'll kind of check oh, them back I, out. I will say that if you're like, oh, you know, this will be something fun to, you know, it, it's going to be a little vulgar and there's going to be stupid stuff for kids. No, there's way too much wang, way too much wang in mm-hmm. that movie. I, I, I've watched porno with less Wang than in Jackass Forever, and that's only slightly hyperbolic. Speaking of Wangs, no, no, <laughs> <Shut up kid. laughs> Speaking of Wangs, Justin, tell me about your epic team up. <laughs> no, I was just thinking. I just wrote a review for Hall Pass, and there was this like part where like he's like taken aback by this large. Uh, member that appears next to his face anyways epic team up um yeah i watched sonic 2 um it was all right uh what is the pro okay so the pro they're kind of running into a transformers problem here where they're spending way much too much time on like the human characters and not enough time on like sonic i mean there's plenty of time on sonic there's more cool sonic stuff in this one compared to the last one but hmm how do I describe this? Okay, so they're like in an avalanche and they use a ring to like transport. Did you ever see the first Sonic movie? Nope, I have not seen either Sonic movie. Okay, okay. Uh, so they transport to um, Hawaii where, um, you know, conveniently there is a uh, beam of light in the sky, which is their MacGuffin, which they have to get to. Anyways, it, the movie takes this whole digression into like this, like the sister-in-law who doesn't like the Marsden guy who's like Sonic's dad or whatever. Um, like his sister-in-law doesn't get married, but it ended up being like this big cover up to like try to catch Sonic. It's, it's retarded. And there's like this whole bridezilla crazy thing in the middle of the movie. But I mean, when it focuses on Sonic, it's, it's a lot of fun. Knuckles. Uh, I mean, they, they executed all that to the T. Um, Robotnik, Jim Carrey, fantastic. Jim Carrey's um, highest uh, opening weekend grossing movie of all time. Wow. Um, Tails, Knuckles. Yeah, they do all that right. Um, just doesn't need to have these these human side characters, which, I mean, they use to kind of like set up this world, but got to figure out how to write them out because they don't need to be there. It's essentially like I think they, they kind of cram them in the story to like give people that are not interested in Sonic something to be interested in, but... Why are you there watching a Sonic movie if you don't want to watch Sonic? So, um, it was pretty good. It just, um, just not digging the, uh, the side, uh, human characters. So, so it sounds like basically they're trying to walk the line between having the human interactions and not have too much Sonic knuckles and tails. Kind of like, you know, the complaint from like the first Godzilla and this was, there's not enough monster fights. And then, Sure. Then, then you you go to like Godzilla versus Kong, and you're like, there's too much monster fights, and it's like, dude, I'm not here for eleven. Like, I want to watch eleven. I'm watching Stranger Things. I want to. I'm here to watch Godzilla fight fucking Kong. And if I'm there to watch Sonic, I'm there to watch Sonic fight Jim Carrey. Like, I don't mm-hmm. care about Cyclops. He can stay back in the X Men. I want to see Sonic fight Jim Carrey. Like, <laughs> oh yeah, Marston, that's funny. Um, yeah, I'm essentially I. Like I said, they did a much better job in this movie compared to the last one. And there was not as much dumb writing in this one compared to the last one. Like, in the last one, like, he's like, oh, I don't know how to go to San Francisco, even though he's, like, the fast, fastest creature in the, the galaxy or universe or whatever. But, um, yeah, Sonic 2, a uh, pretty sweet poster, too. My kid was playing, like, the Genesis, um, like, emulator stuff and playing the old Sonic game. So it's pretty fun to watch that. Nice, nice. All right, um, your last one. There could only be... You watched The Highlander? I did watch Highlander for the first time. I was okay. wondering if you were going to pick up on that. I thought about calling it the Spanish... Uh, the, 
the Egyptian Spaniard, but I mean, because only, only Sean Connery can play an Egyptian Spaniard. Like, um, <laughs> also, you know, getting a, having a katana from before katanas were made and, oh uh, no, it was just, it was cheesy, but it was great. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, it just, I mean, it's not a good movie, but it was a hell of a lot of fun. Um, it just had like that perfect amount of cheese and silliness, but you know, also it's a fighting movie. Um, so, I, and I liked a lot of the flashbacks. Um, one of the, I think the coolest things was at the front of the movie, they had the fabulous Freebirds, you know, the pretty famous wrestling stable, but they're in MSG and MSG in the eighties was pretty predominantly WWF territory and the Freebirds were pretty much down in uh, Jim Crockett promotions or like in Texas because wrestling then was still big in the territory. So it was very interesting that they had them. They're not saying that like they couldn't be there, obviously, but the the North was the WWE, like the Midwest was um a AMW or a AMA W something. It was Kurt Henning's father's promotion. Um, so. It's just interesting that, that that was in there. Um, of course, me and Carl, being huge wrestling fans, are like the Freebirds in New York. That doesn't track, but no, it was um, it, w- it was a lot of fun, and uh, I wish I kind of had watched it sooner. Cool. All right, so uh, you got to catch up on a classic. Which classic we catch up on? I caught up on whatever happened to Baby Jane. This is a 1962 movie. Um, not sure how many of you out there have seen Grey Gardens, but it's it's kind of an essentially a Grey Gardens mix up with Sunset Boulevard. You have these two like former uh, child prodigy singers who uh, end up being together, and their uh, you know their careers are you know kaput now, and a lot of resentment. One of them's uh, crippled, and the other one's taking care of them supposedly, and things aren't quite what they seem. It, pretty good acting, intense storytelling. Definitely had me on the edge of my seat throughout to see how it would play out. And um, yeah, I didn't know what to expect from this, but it's you know pretty good um, toxic uh, family psychological thriller. What right. happened to Baby Jane? Okay, not never even heard of it. <laughs> my next one I've seen. I, there's these more feminine uh, or female uh, thrillers out there that I've been meaning to see the other one okay so now that i've seen uh whatever happened to baby jane i need to seek out oh what is it called i think it's mommy dearest is what i need to to see i've heard <laughs> i heard about that my whole life from my mom she's like do not call me mommy dearest because yeah that's a child abuse movie from what i hear oh okay mm-hmm. all right our featured presentation uh it's pulp fiction my uh, 90s pick from uh, that category from Joey. So, came out in 1994. An American black comedy crime film written and directed by QT, our boy. Uh, starring John Travolta, Sam L. Jackson, Bruce Willis, Tim Roth, and Uma Thurman. Uh, it tells the stories of uh, crime in L.A. The title refers to a pulp magazines and hard-boiled crime novels popular during the mid-20th century, known for their graphic violence and punchy dialogue. Definitely fits this movie. Uh, let's see, Tarantino, he wrote it um, in between 92 and 93. The plot occurs out of chronological order, as we'll go through here in a second. Uh, the film is self-referential. Um, you know, it opens up with those definitions of first pulp being, you know, like a... This is, kind of ambiguous matter and then the other pulp being the more um you know literary sense uh considerable screen time is devoted to the monologues and casual conversations eclectic dialogue revealing each character's perspective on several situations debates the film features an ironic combination of humor and strong violence very nicely uh, put there by wikipedia and i love to say that pulp fiction did win the palm d'or over red which is, um, you know, another movie we covered here on the podcast. Uh, ended up getting uh, QT, his uh, first uh, Best Original Screenplay Oscar. And, yeah, there's a lot to talk about here. I mean, can you recall the first time you heard about Pulp Fiction? Um, before that, though, so 
this uh, this was the the movie that encapsulated or embodied the '90s, personified the '90s to you. So, I mean, I guess we're probably going to go into it some while we're talking. But what made you pick this over, you know, something like Clueless or Ten Things I Hate About You or any of the other tons of movies that probably could have been picked, Romeo and Juliet or Titanic or, you know, something of that nature. I mean, this was a big, um, you know, launching point for the independent film um, movement in America or in, throughout the world, throughout the, um, the early 90s. Um, there's a lot about it that's pretty uh, typical 90s. I mean, you have... <laughs> This random girl that gets gunned down whenever um, Bruce Willis crashes the car is like the most typically '90s dressed female you'll you'll see. Um, oh, you mean Kathy Griffin? Well, no, no, it's, get, it's, she, it's she didn't get shot. It's the other girl. She was just there. You're right. Yeah, Kathy Griffin's in jeans. I think the other girl's in like white um, jean shorts. Anywho, um, you know those are kind of my excuses. But you know, I just really wanted to watch this movie, and it does fit the category. So. I mean, look, there's something wrong with just wanting to watch this movie. Like, it's kind <laughs> of sad that our um, our logo is us doing Pulp Fiction, and it took yeah. us to, like, season three, like, episode, what, like, 58 or something? <laughs> 17. <laughs> um, well, it's season three, episode 17, but, like, yeah. 47, episode, like, 47 or whatever for us to... Mm. Uh, to do this movie and it's our really our first like main episode that's focused on a Tarantino movie obviously we did our first bonus episode which was on Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and we briefly talked about Kill Bill in reference to Lady Snowblood back in season one well I did but, pick Death Proof for my oh, Kurt you did Russell do, you did do Death Proof that's true so I guess it's our second one because mm-hmm. I uh I was cheeky and picked a Quentin Tarantino written movie. Uh, uh-huh. So, <laughs> but yeah, it just probably should have done this sooner, but here we are. So, um, but to answer your question, like I found out about Pulp Fiction. I'm going to guess from Troy during my senior year of high school. So that would have been 2002 into 2003. So at that point, it was already eight, nine years old. Um, and remembered just being blown away by it. I don't outside of you know just that's that's the movie that put me on to Quentin Tarantino, and I think I went from that to. I'm pretty. I guess it was Res Dogs. The next one I remember is Kill Bill, but mm-hmm. that was the first one I saw in theaters from from him. But I mean, I was just blown away by the dis the disjointed storyline, um, just the the dialogue and and how they talked and how it was fast and um and then as you know, I started watching more of his movies, you know, like Red Apples are in everything and Big Kahuna's and everything, and it's just hmm. they all reference back on each other. It reminded me a lot of Stephen King, where there was a lot of the same stuff in his novels as far as brands and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, taking place in the same place or in the same universe. So then he makes all of these like pop culture references, which um, I kind of do all excessively in my everyday life. Um, and I guess it's just all, all thanks to Mr. QT. So, yeah, this is one of my um, movies that I remember my uncle recommending. Cause we kind of were sitting at my uh, grandparents, um, table having dinner and he was just going on about Pulp Fiction and Fargo um this one summer I was you know pretty intrigued by that don't remember exactly the first time I watched it but I always remember remember really enjoying the dialogue um some aspects of it more then and now which we'll get into but um yeah super I it's just such an engaging thing and like my dad doesn't quite get it and I've watched Pulp Fiction with him at least once or twice and you're just like, yeah, Justin loves that dialogue. I'm like, but oh, it's so infectious and just rolls off the tongue so easily and all ties back together. And I mean, I just watched it the two and a half hours leading up to us starting the show and that's by far the quickest it's ever gone by and I was taking notes throughout and, you know, did notice a few things. You definitely um, 
some things get a little locked in a little better whenever you're, you know, writing about them fresh in the moment. But um, yeah, it just flew by and yeah, I'm anxious to kind of go through it. So I remember, so I watched it, you know, so I was 17, maybe 18, depending on when I watched it in my senior year of high school. And I remember, you know, going to college and then coming back home. And I remember um, me and my friend Casey wanting, she and I wanted to get TJ, who did the um, rubber episode of Schlock Talk with me. We wanted Mm -hmm. to get him to watch Pulp Fiction. And so, you know, I agreed to watch uh, Donnie Darko in exchange to him <laughs> watching Pulp Fiction. And yeah. I just remember him thinking, him not being impressed, didn't see what the big deal was, why it was, you know, so controversial in the 90s. Because, I mean, now, seeing people use drugs isn't that big a deal. People, seeing people use heroin was kind of a big deal in 94. Yeah, we'd seen, like, you know, Al Pacino bury himself in a mountain of cocaine, but that's not literally seeing someone pull the blood out of their vein into the syringe Mm-hmm. and shoot it back in after you see the bent spoon. Like, that was kind of a big deal in 94. Um, hmm. So, you know, plus just so much ra- uh, uh, violence and lots of racism and mm-hmm. um, just, you know. But the movie is so, like you said, the dialogue is infectious. It's so quotable. I know it gets a lot of flack now for the for Tarantino playing Jimmy and dropping the N-word. But, I mean, it was movies 30 years ago. Like, things were a lot different. Um, so, and like Sam Jackson didn't kill him. Sam Jackson's also, you know, the one that convinced, uh, Leo to use that word in, um, Django, even though it's a much different context. Like, you know, you're playing a slave owner in the 1800s, like you're going to use that word, but still it's, it's, it's just one of those things where this is such a piece of Americana, like Mm -hmm. There's not a, I don't feel like there's a lot of movies, you know, at least not off the top of my head. I'm sure if we sat down and talked about it, it might be different. But, you know, you think about like Americana movies and, you know, you're going to say what, like Citizen Kane or Casablanca or, you know, something from that golden age of, of Hollywood. And mm-hmm. this, this movie, you know, Star Wars, like obviously, but like this is the movie from like our generation that kind of falls into that. Americana, like you think of American cinema, and this this is one of them. Well, it brings stylistic cinema into like um, more of a the popular culture because um, you do have Tarantino who's obsessively into you know s- copying the style and adapting the style and working with different um, story conventions that he's seen before and like these pulp uh, novels and um, yeah, bringing it into a very palpable like gangster setting um so yeah very uh it's it's easy to see why you know he uh i mean kubrick and tarantino were the first like and spielberg were probably the first directors i was ever like aware of like this is the person who made these movies and this is their catalog of movies so um yeah so yeah we get a little bit of a cold open here with that jumping right into the the honey bunny scene and the diner um, got Tim Roth and um, what's her name? Uh, I don't know the actress's name. But yeah, they're sitting there talking about. They're just kind of shooting the shit, and um, it's interesting to hear how essentially they're talking about like different. Like they were to, they're talking about like liquor store robberies and like bank robberies and stuff. So they're kind of like dissecting robberies in general. And then like all of a sudden they're like, once they're on this wavelength where they want to stick up the diner, like they're all about it. So there's, you actually kind of feel a shift in the conversation there. It's played by Amanda Plummer as honey bunny. Yeah. They, they definitely go from like talking about like how, different it is between like robbing a bank where all the money's insured. They're not really supposed to try to stop you. Someone mm-hmm. robbed them with a mobile phone. Whereas if you go to the liquor store, they're owned by a lot of foreigners and you know, that's, you know, you can kind of see the disdain. I think the disdain there is more of, it's hard for us to rob them. I don't think necessarily, uh, I, I don't know if they necessarily care that they're foreign because they're foreign, just they don't speak English. They were um, getting at the fact that them. it's more precious to them since they are like, you know, first generation America kind of trying to defend or, their or, own. Or the 12th generation Jewish person. I'm like, well, there's might've been 12 generations, but yeah, the mm. 12, the, you know, the yeah, do you 12, you that? know, 
Yeah, and the, you know he's got a magnum or a shotgun, and you know they're gonna make us kill him, mm-hmm. you know us or them kind of thing. So then all of a sudden they're like, oh yeah, this place like you, everything's insured. You know you're gonna get all these extra wallets, and you know mm-hmm. you're gonna make a lot of extra money. And then they go right into the they're gonna do it, and then that's where you get that first jump because then the screen goes black, mm-hmm. and you're jettisoned to the next thing. Yeah, it's almost like they flip a light switch with how they're like, oh, I love you, honey bunny, and then they snap into this. There's a lot of snapping into violence throughout this film that I uh, I noticed a lot this time, and a lot of a lot of um, talk about Im- immigrate immigrant um, immigrants, um, ranging from yeah what you were just talking about there with like Vietnamese store owners, Jewish store owners, and just throughout this whole thing, there's commentary on like um, international aspects. So that was kind of an interesting thing to see uh, QT tie in there i'm not sure if it has any real significance but um yeah it's it's interesting to see that was what was going on through his brain but um perfect song just just a brilliant uh catchy tune there as in that iconic uh qt signature text looks just fantastic the yellow and red and then the white with kind of like the uh the kind of fancy lettering and then in the middle of the credits all of a sudden you know it switches to a jungle boogie and um yeah off in another direction. So Quentin Tarantino has this insane ability to take music that me, myself, or maybe even a lot of people, I don't know. Like, I probably would not listen to that music outside of this movie. But in the movie, it makes sense. It always makes perfect sense. Whether it... he, And I don't know how he fucking does it. Like, I, I don't know how he does it, but... You know, he just he puts on music and you're like, man, I would probably never listen to this if it wasn't because of this movie or, you know, whether it's, you know, whatever he's got playing in um, shit, uh, Death Proof or Kill Bill or Pulp Fiction. It's just, you know, it always fits. And I, I just don't know how the hell he does it. Like the man has probably forgotten more about making movies than most people have ever known. And then we go into, uh, yeah, just kind of talking um uh, with Vincent and Jules, we uh, they were just kind of chilling in the car, um, riding to their uh, like like job. one of the most one of the most iconic scenes. Mm-hmm. The movie has so many, but I mean Royale with cheese. Like I mean, it's like your ears suddenly perk up with like the topics that they're. I mean, they're so mundane and have nothing to do with driving the plot forward. But at the same thing, it's so compelling to hear them, you know, talk about all the differences and. Europe, and then they get into pot and how it's legal in Amsterdam, and then they get into McDonald's. I mean, just stuff that, you know, people actually talk about and, you know, kind of find interesting. And there's all these little factoids buried in there that make it, you know, that much more interesting. It also, it makes them, it humanizes them. It makes them normal, even though, because at this point, we don't know what the fuck they're doing. But, like, even having seen this movie a bunch, and you know they're, you know, assassins or hitman or whatever you want to call them it humanizes them. They're still talking about, you know, there's dudes talking about, Oh, he's been abroad and he's just telling his buddy, like, this is, this is what it's like over there. It's so different, especially in the nineties. You can't just go on YouTube or TikTok and see a video from Europe or something that's in Amsterdam or mm-hmm. something that's in Paris or England or whatever. It's a much different time period. Yeah. World in terms of the amount of information that's available. So Yeah. And then we go into the um, foreshadowing the Mia Wallace scene. They go on and on about debating <laughs> uh, going down on a girl versus giving her foot massage, and <laughs> kind of get a early taste of uh, you know QT's strong desire towards the feet. Um, the factoid about what a pilot is. So so much good stuff, and I just love how the camera seamlessly just kind of follows them as they're like burning time before they yeah they. They uh, crash these guys' burger breakfast. Mmm, <laughs> yes. Oh, the good old Kahuna burger. Oh, and can't can't move on without mentioning that awesome shot from like he actually got the camera like in the back of the car, shooting up towards the two guys from like the guns' perspective. Super cool there. Oh, where they're getting the guns out of, the, and they're talking about they should have fucking shotguns. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep, because they don't know how many guys are in there. So yeah, they're even. I mean, along with talking and, the sh- you know, just shooting the shit about stuff, they're talking about the job and saying, <laughs> going into this pretty ill-equipped. So, but, um, yeah, just 
like for instance, we're like, oh, we're not quite ready yet. And then we, we, you know, we, the camera stays in front of the door, just kind of slides off to the, um, pans over, um, to the side where they're, uh, you know, continuing to talk and we just kind of get a, a, a view of them from over there. So. Oh yeah. Just great. Just great camera work. Like this movie is so, so well done. Okay, and then, um, yeah, they crash into the guys. They want to get the case. Um, I'm not sure if you have strong thoughts about the 666 um, mysterious MacGuffin case. I don't really, I mean, I guess when I first saw this, I just thought of it as like gold bars or something in there. But, I mean, there's all these wacky theories about it being like, you know, Elvis's soul or whatever. Not, but, um, um eh. no, not, uh, not Elvis's soul. Um, Ving Rhames' soul. Oh, right, um, right. That escaped um, I, through the, the the scratch on the back of his neck that he just yeah, happened yeah, so, to get shaving. <laughs> yeah, so I, I always took it before. I always took it as drugs, like okay. as as heroin or cocaine or mm-hmm. or something, or maybe a case full of money or, like you said, gold. You know, something of that nature. I mean, yeah, obviously, like would Quentin Tarantino do some shit like, oh, it's his soul that was taken out the back of his neck, but he got the band aid because he shaved his head for the role and just happened to cut himself there. So like, while that's the cool theory, I, one, obviously we're not supposed to know, or Quentin would have showed us or he mm-hmm. would have told us in the 30 years since this movie has been out. God, that hurts my heart to say it for the second time. Ugh. Um, but, but yeah, I just, uh, I mean, the 666, that was just edgy and cool and, oh, we're bad or whatever. But, like, you know, early 90s, that's going to ruffle all the all the conservatives' feathers. So, um, I mean, Travolta has a great performance in this. Like, he has this super kind of stubborn but cool demeanor, like, throughout that's really compelling to watch as we see him be this real likable character but also a dick at times. Um, I like how they, they tie the metric system back into, you know, harassing the guys as he was like, say what again? And yeah, they shoot him and yeah, not, not too good for those guys, but, um, Oh man, what does Marcellus Wallace look like? <laughs> what? <laughs> does he look like a bitch? <laughs> Why are you trying to fuck him like one, Brett? Once again, oh, um, man. yeah, snapping into violence. Um, it's interesting since, uh, Vince, Vincent is a um, real into that Bible verse and like, you know, proclaiming, but pro- proclaiming that he's unleashing the Lord's vengeance and stuff. But at the same time, you know, he's this hit man. So, you, you know, you kind of see this kind of contradiction there. But then towards the end, you can kind of see how he's more of a spiritualist. So, yeah, maybe maybe not like true religious, but definitely spiritual, even though, you know, he does the don't blaspheme thing. Um but yeah, it's, uh, I mean, like he said, it's just some cold-blooded shit to say to a person mm-hmm. before he pops a cap in them. So. And then we get to meet Butch and Marsalis. Uh, you can tell Marsalis is definitely a manipulator. He's, you know, Mar- talking Marcellus? to Butch. Marsalis? Where, where's Marsalis coming? That's Marcellus. Okay. <laughs> talking to Butch about, uh, you know, don't worry about your pride, you know, just, you know. Take take the fall. That's take just the fall your pride the fucking with you. And the mm-hmm. at, and the fourth, no, in the fifth, in the fifth, your ass goes down. Get to see uh, Vincent and um, Jules in their goofy clothes, kind of foreshadowing. It's gonna happen a little next with Mar. What's kind of coming up with Marvin? Um, even though it already happened at that point. Um, uh, yeah, I thought it was interesting that John Travolta basically shows no respect to. Uh, Bruce Willis's character Butch calls him a um, a palooka, which is basically an inferior average price fighter. Or I've, I've, also, I've also seen that it is someone who it, it's a it's like slur to people who take dives in fights. Okay. Um, also, um, it's not said anywhere, but uh, I've read that Tar- I have not read where Tarantino. I saw Tarantino say this, but I have read on numerous places that Tarantino published or said it or whatever that it is um when we get to the next scene where they're talking about his car getting keyed that butch is the one who keyed his car and that's so it's an ongoing rivalry between the two Mm -hmm. um 
and I feel like maybe that there should have been, you know, maybe we should have seen that or there should have been something where we would have known. Um, but it's just, I guess, supposed to be inferred, but I don't think anybody ever really inferred that. Yeah, I never really caught on to that, but that makes complete sense, especially whenever you kind of notice their rivalry a little bit. It's it's definitely played on the more subtle side, but um, there, if you looking close. Um, I guess we'll jump forward into um, Vince and Mia, which, what would you I would say this is probably my least favorite chapter. It's definitely good, but... Um, it's definitely not as entertaining as the rest of them. Although I would, I'm starting to th- um, butch um, in the gold watch that's starting to edge up on. So, so you you don't like the scene where Vincent goes to her house and picks her up, and then they go to Jack Rabbit Slim's and that like really cool restaurant or the wax museum with a pulse as a uh, yeah. As, as um, I mean, I like it. It's just. It's it's the one chapter where I'm like, okay, I would kind of wish this would hurry up and you know get to the next chapter. I mean, maybe I appreciated it more because now I've I've seen some Amy Van Doren films and I've seen some. Um, okay. Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn Monroe. There we go. The, the, I mean, I've seen some of those films. Like obviously, I knew who Marilyn Monroe was, but I'd never seen any of her movies until, you know, not that long ago. Um, and then I watched a couple of Mamie Van Doren movies last year. Um, which I only remembered her name because of Quentin, the scene in Quentin Tarantino. Um, that is uh, the scene where Steve Buscemi gets his little cameo. So, mm-hmm. um, um, I mean, of course, I like the square because you know it ends up getting referenced back in Kill Bill. So, okay, I didn't realize that. I mean, uh, the, your, your ears the, instantly perk up when you're you know they're talking about what they the scene starts with piercing right and then she's like oh that's done my tongue and then they go into the whole like blowjob talk about tongue rings which you know probably wasn't common knowledge back in the early 90s right yeah i feel like that was you know a lot different especially even talking about like getting your getting those piercings and it's not done with a gun because you know even when oh, like i started of it mm-hmm. yeah like when i was getting my my ears pierced in like the late 90s you know just a few years after that you know, it's still, I mean, even getting your ears pierced was by a gun. I mean, it's only been recently where people are like, hey, you know, that d- actually damages your ears, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, you would still think, hey, they're going to take that gun and stick it in my nose and, and or, you know, they're going to put it on my nipple or whatever. So, you know, that was something that I, th- I don't think that like the the typical culture, uh, you know, the masses would have known about or, you know, that you got a tongue ring and it, you know, as she said, helps fellatio um, mm-hmm. kind of deal also. Yep, gets that uh, the heroin there. Talks about all the different kinds, and so that's all fun to hear about. And the and, Pepsi uh, challenge—that's a fucking throwback. <laughs> oh yeah, to uh, I compare my stuff to the Amsterdam stuff anytime. Um, then he goes on and on about the car that you had just referenced. So um, one of the more noir aspects of the movie, I think, is a lot of the obvious rear projection whenever they're in the car riding around. I think that's the biggest thing that stands out, and it's mostly when Vince is in the car going to Mia's place because he's he's shot up and he's like you know in the zone, and we see like the the rear projection there, and then whenever Butch gets picked up from the cabbie after the fight is very very stylish oh, noir. Yeah, for for sure, that that even feels like it with the ways talking to like the the cabbie to mm-hmm. um, Esmeralda Villa Lobos. Yeah, also, you know, Butch is what girlfriend is, uh, you know, she's like French, I guess. And then the other girl well, says, you know, she's from yeah, Colombia. She, she's probably Vietnamese, I would guess, thinking really? about to when things are, um, she, I don't know, she, she looked, um, she looked Caucasian to me, but, um, oh, no, 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 I'm just confusing myself. Yeah, she is French in some, some capacity. Mm-hmm. I don't, I, I'm thinking of like, Indochina when they're talking about at the end and how everything's colonized, but they do make the point of, he does say you don't speak Bora and Bora or Bora Bora and either. And it's like, but they speak French and Bora Bora. Um, Oh, do they? (laughs) uh, Yeah. I didn't know that. Carl kind of threw that little bit of tidbit of info out at me. So um, if that's wrong, you know, double check me and tell me that I'm speaking out my ass, but yeah, no, she's definitely, (laughs) she's definitely French. Um, Not so too familiar with the the John Travolta uh, confused meme whenever uh, Mia is talking to him over the intercom but yeah you can definitely see it whenever you you know you've probably seen that meme in passing and then definitely apparent when he's gonna like 
He doesn't even know to push the intercom button. <laughs> a little spaced out. Kick-ass soundtrack. Oh, yeah. For sure. The house was kick-ass. Their sound system was kick-ass. So, yeah. Um, yep. Kind of already mentioned the homage to the 50s diner there. Steve Buscemi. Um, make a little cameo. Why do we have to talk about BS to make us feel comfortable? Um, that really kind of resonated resonated this time because this whole movie is about just talking bullshit <laughs> in between like um, violent snaps of um, you know these people enraged or whatever the case might be. So um, yeah, that was a uh, that really stood out to me this time, kind of as a kind of a centerpiece to you know what this film is kind of doing for us. Um, and I, I often do think about the uncomfortable silences thing whenever I'm like sitting there at like a date with uh, Chris, uh, my wife and it's like, oh, yeah, we've been together 20 some years. I guess we can just kind of sit here in silence and it <laughs> not be the worst thing in the world. Yeah. Um, and I guess we, we kind of glossed over it um, in the beginning oh, yeah. when we were, you know, we were, we were talking about um, foot massages and eating pussy or whatever. But, you know, mm-hmm. that whole thing is that one of their co-workers, one of their homies or whatever, got thrown off a four-story balcony through a greenhouse. Um, mm-hmm. and, you know, it was, is that um, it reasonable? Was, it was uh, for mas- supposedly massaging Mia Wallace's feet. And, you know, mm-hmm. she's like, just, she's, you know, and so he, she goes to the bathroom and does a line of Coke and comes back. And uh, Ben says like, well, I've got something to say, but you can't be offended. And then they go back and forth. And he finally, he's like, so, you know, you know, Tony Rocky Horror, you know, you know, one way to put it is that Antoine threw him off that four story balcony because of you, because, mm-hmm. you know, he gave you a foot massage and she's like, D- does that even make any sense? Like, listen to yourself. And he's like, I guess it did at the time. Like this was one of those things where it, it when you first hear it, you're like, damn, that's really fucked up. But then you say it out loud to somebody and you're like, you know, that just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah. Good point. Um, it's fun how, this role was, yeah, John Travolta's big comeback, and he gets the dance floor scene there with a twist. And um, if you've ever seen um, Fellini's Eight and a Half, there's this kind of this really cool suave dance moment that um, I have heard was QT was referencing here. So be yeah, I got for that. I just heard that also on like a Watch Mojo list or something. Oh. It might have been, it might have even been about Pulp Fiction, like specifically. I don't remember, but I remember Things you didn't know or something. Yeah, something one of like. 10 things you didn't know, blah, blah, blah. That might be where I heard the the thing about Butch Keenan's car. All right. Uh, man, I don't want to be seen as a miso- uh, misogynist, but uh, ladies do like to hassle you about stuff that doesn't really matter in moments of crisis. Have you experienced that? I... Don't think that I have, but I also have not been married for 20 years. Or maybe you're just <laughs> blowing it out of proportion because you have been. I don't. I don't know. I. I feel like everybody can probably kind of be a hassle because um, you know you've, you. Everyone's probably trying to help and may not understand what another person is trying to do to help in their own way. And then it. You know. Okay, I'll give an example. So, in a typical situation, let's say me and uh, so I'm in the car with my wife and the tire blows out we won't just focus on replacing the tire instead a lot of times my wife will be like well why didn't you get an inspection lately or something i'm like well that doesn't really matter what matters is the fact that we're broken down on the side of the road but you want to mention what i didn't do so that's kind of what i'm getting at i mean i guess you know to a degree i could understand to say in that very specific example because if you've got your kids and the tire blows and you end up in a wreck or something. But like at the same time, you could have went and got that inspection and the tire, you know, perfectly a okay and mm-hmm. run over something or turn mm-hmm. to still just happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's so, but I mean, maybe that's more of, I, I won't say it's hassling. I feel like maybe it's more of like a, a maternal instinct of protecting even even if it's you and her over you know, whatever sure it's just in, in in turn it's a lot easier to get frustrated when you're in a moment of crisis like that and you're getting like what i what i've called hassled um yeah you know, for, about something for, about something that's other than the main concern 
I, I, and I think, you know, that can, I, I agree. Like if you're getting hassled by something, whether it, by whoever that mm-hmm. you could, it, it exasperates the situation because it's now instead of you trying to focus on whatever it is you're focusing on, now you have to focus on X, Y, Z while also trying to focus on a, so no, I can, I can understand, you know, someone being upset by someone else hassling them in a, in a like crisis moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, I'll never forget the joke because uh, they uh, they tease it and then we don't get to hear it. And then we hear it and it's, it's, it's an all right little joke with the, with the baby tomatoes say to the mama tomato, uh, catch up after they smushed it. So. Yeah. All right. Jumping forward, we get the gold watch. Um, maybe the scene that steals the whole movie with Christopher Walken. Um, just really blowing it out of the out of the park there we had so much fun detail but it ends up just being like this watch <laughs> with um... i would be i would be real i would not want that watch after uh <laughs> after five years in one guy's ass and him dying of dysentery and then two more years <laughs> of another guy's ass no thanks you know what you can you can keep that watch i'm i'm okay we don't actually see the 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 boxing match that butch throws kind of wrist war dog style there um Definitely see the aftermath, though, as we hear about it on the radio, as we find out that the guy he fought ends up dying. Um, I guess a little shout out to Bruce Willis now. He found out that he's retiring from acting because of um, some mental problems or uh, some he has like dementia or something, right? Um, it, yeah, it's uh, some some sort of dementia condition. I don't remember exactly what it was called, but um, something to do where he, yeah, ba- basically it's dementia. And some people have come out and said that they're surprised it took this long, that Bruce didn't really seem like Bruce in the last couple of years. So hopefully, mm-hmm. um, you know, he'll, he'll get some good care. He should have enough money to get, you know, be able to get the kind of care and stuff that he'll need. So um, hopefully yeah. it'll be um, as as easy as it can be for him going forward. So, but, you know, yeah, sh- shout out to, to old John McClane. Yeah, it's a shame we'll never get him in another QT film. It'd been, it'd been pretty nice to see them re- uh, have a reunion for the uh, QT's final film, but probably not meant to be. But I did love the line where he was talking about his crack rib, and she's like, "From giving me oral pleasure." <laughs> so oh, that whole that kind of that whole thing with him in the hotel room is is so kind of adorable because yeah, they're a little pet um, talk. Yeah, and just well, will you kiss it? And then you know they talk oh, about I. yeah, and so he they had already talked about uh, fellatio, and they had already talked about is it you know as bad as eating her pussy? No, and then they, but then it's like well, it's like well, we've been, and I guess it's supposed to show that she's you know she's a little innocent. I don't want I'm a little more innocent. I wasn't going to use innocent, but I guess that's the best word. Obviously, she's not a fighter who's you know being bought out by gangsters or a gangster kind of thing. So yeah, it's definitely She's not the savvy Esmeralda who's asking what it's like to kill a man. <laughs> in <the> right. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. And you get um, the second time where you see some bare feet cause you see um, Uma's bare feet in the dance yep. scene. And then you see, even though they're, they're, know. they're very small clips and then you see her like driving barefoot. And so it's like all these things would make sense for them to be barefoot. I dr- if, if I'm going anywhere that's not to work, I'm probably driving barefoot. Um, oh. And, um, you know, getting on that dance floor, yeah, she takes off her, her heels or whatever. So it totally makes sense. It's a lot more sense than uh, Margot Robbie just walking into the movie theater and throwing her feet up on the chair in front of her, just bare feet. Or, you know, drinking from, um, oh, shit. Um Selma Hayek's foot, you know, I totally would would have done the same thing. But, you know, he's like, hey, hey, Rich Rod, uh, Rob Rich, whatever, uh, Rob Rod, there we go. Rich Rod's a football coach. Hey, Robert Rodriguez, write this scene in this movie for me, please. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you have Butch talking like all like uh, pet talk with uh, his lady friend there, but then he totally snaps. When he finds out she left the watch, um, but then he kind of reels himself in. So, yeah, just wanted to point out another instance of, you know, somebody acting, you know, pretty normal. And then all of a sudden, like launching into violence. aggression. Oh, yeah. He snapped 
super quick. He did calm down and, 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 you know, I guess did his best to reconcile and, and, and apologize, um, you know, for breaking the TV and throwing shit and all of that. So it's a little thing, but I, I really appreciate the, the scene where the camera just follows Butch as he's sneaking towards his apartment. Cause obviously he parks like a few blocks away or whatever. And so he can be a little more inconspicuous inconspicuous but it's fun that's not a stylistic thing you, you pick up right away unless you're kind of looking for it so enjoyed seeing that um but feel cheated that vincent gets taken out on the toilet like a bitch thoughts um, he wasn't on the toilet he was coming out of the toilet but uh, yes. it's one of the things that you notice they keep talking vincent goes to the bathroom a lot like he goes to take a piss and he finds mm-hmm. me uh um od'd and then he's going to take a shit in the diner at the end Mm-hmm. Well, the end of what we see, but the middle of the movie. Um, and then he's, you know, he's using the bathroom there. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, surprisingly, one of the side effects of heroin use is constipation. So that's why he oh. always has his, has his book. <laughs> yeah. has you with book. all the factoids. Uh, again, I'm pretty sure I watched uh, 10 things I don't, you didn't know about Pulp Fiction. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, so... The other thing to that that ties into that scene is um, he wasn't killed with his own gun because he carries a handgun. Mm-hmm. That was um, Marcellus's gun, or at least that's a theory. Because notice where was Marcellus going? Marcellus was right down the block getting coffee and donuts. Right. So he would left to go get breakfast, you know, because they I guess expected to be staked out there all day. Hmm. I never, mm-hmm. I never put that together, but it makes a lot of sense. I was just like, oh man, it's really random that he's right there. No, he was there, he was there with Vincent because um, Jules was gone. Okay. I don't see Marcellus wanting to go to a job, but uh, maybe he just wanted to. Uh, I mean, he was probably a little bit too. I mean, he was probably pissed. Yeah. That, you know that guy. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> But he gets a little bit more pissed coming up. <laughs> oh yeah, just a little bit. Boy, howdy! I love the the reoccurring kangaroo thing where it's a, that that little white little ceramic whatever that for that wasn't looking like a kangaroo in my opinion. But um, I do like the Captain Kangaroo song. Watching Captain Dude. Kangaroo. <laughs> That's well before our time, baby. Well before our time. I already mentioned the '90s lady. Who's in the very '90s clothes with her jean short, um, shorts? Her jorts. There you go. Oh, pride. Oh yeah, the pride conversation comes back whenever um they're escaping. So yeah, they get in the little fight. Okay, so Butch is driving away, runs into Marsala or <laughs> Marcellus Wallace. Oh, um, they got me all paranoid. Hold on, we have skipped. And maybe this is what you're about to talk about here, but it feels like we have well, skipped a, a whole scene of this movie. I know. I was setting up the fact that, you know, he, he hits them, they get in the car crash, and then they, they start fighting. And no, then no, they, no. We, they end up we, in... Oh, okay. Go ahead. We, we, we missed... You don't want to be yeah, on the Zed yet? No, we... We miss the whole, unless, yeah, I don't see it anywhere in here, and we're about to go, never mind, I see it, never mind, never mind, okay, we're good, continue. <laughs> Got your chapters mixed up? Uh, I just didn't see it anywhere, and all I saw at the bottom, I didn't read what was there, I just saw this, and then the verdict situation, and it's like, never mind, I see, I see back to where we're at, Okay. Yep, started skinny and down the notes, but like you said, I can recall what happens in this hair picture. Um, Just a little bit. <laughs> but they end up in the pawn shop with a bunch of rednecks in L.A. Okay. Um, I mean, rednecks are everywhere, baby. Rednecks are everywhere. I mean, don't don't be messing with the bad guy from the mask. Jeez. <laughs> um. But yeah, he calls Zed up, and there's this whole weird thing where yeah, they uh, ball gag him, and you know, and have do uh, any mini miny mo. Uh, I'm not sure what the gimp was there. What was it, like the gimp being a baby, a freaky babysitter? I, I don't even see what the gimp's I mean, it, purpose was in this scene. 
I think it was shock value. Like I think it was pure yeah. shock value to go with, you know, they've got this person held hostage and I guess now he's Stockholm syndrome enough that he's just their gimp or that, you know, that that's mm. that whole nother world that the public at that point didn't really know anything about. Mm. Um, I mean, and that was another big thing. Like you, um, you know, we were talking about, you know, the intravenous drug use earlier, or at least I was being a big deal, like mm-hmm. seeing a man get raped, like, was not a common it's still not a common thing now but especially not in 1994 like Mm -hmm. that's um and and you know that you like you said the ball gags and then we're talking about the gimp like all of that is that's like some next level next level stuff for the time period uh we start getting uh, a lot of the n-word there which um i think i'll get into more here coming up but um yeah the the classic scene where he's upgrading from what a hammer to a baseball bat to a chainsaw to the samurai sword. And Great every one that... of mm-hmm. every oh. one of those weapons is an homage to a different movie. Um the chainsaw is Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Okay. Um one of the movies is ha- one of the weapons the I guess the hammer is Halloween. Oh. Okay. Um I don't remember what the bat, maybe the bat was Halloween. One of those is Halloween. And then the sword was to some samurai movie I had never heard of. I wish I had wrote all of that stuff down, but um, that was it, it, like, of course it was. Of course they are all homages to other movies because, you mm-hmm. know, it wouldn't be a Quentin movie without an homage to everything and anything under the sun. Yeah. I just love how it follows his eyes up to that pinnacle weapon and, yeah, there's a big moment there. And um, it's a chopper, baby. So you take Butch, who's a boxer. Okay. It, it definitely feels like he would have picked the hammer or the baseball bat over the katana. Like, that feels like the weapon you would see some, some Yahoo grabbing in a movie today because, you know, it's a katana and it's cool. It feels like, you know, him being this boxer, you know, using his, you know, hands to fight, like he would have picked just like a bludgeoning weapon as opposed to like a slicing and stabbing weapon, at least to me, maybe I, maybe I'm just looking too much into it, but it just, it just kind of dawned on me watching it. Um, when we watched it for this, I was like, I feel like Butch would have taken like the baseball bat and just like tried to knock someone's head off. He definitely takes on kind of a uh, Bruce Lee kind of persona whenever he starts chopping them up because he kind of has that like that shake to him, you know, out of like aggression as he strikes and stuff. So it definitely kind of takes on more of an Asian um, combat feel to it at that point. Yep. And uh, kills Zed and the other guy and gets out of there and um, helps uh, Marsala. (laughs) Marcellus. (laughs) And you know he's gonna he's gonna get medieval on his ass. He's gonna call up a couple of hard uh, mm-hmm. pipe hitting homies yep. and um, get, go to go to town on him with a pair of pliers and a blowtorch. I don't mm-hmm. I don't think Zed's gonna make it till those guys show up. I mean, like we've seen they've got cellular phones, but I mean, who knows where they are in L.A. compared to where they normally are? They don't have GPS. Like, mm-hmm. I think I think homeboy who shot somewhere between his dick and his gut is uh, gonna die. Um, out for yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, Bruce Willis takes off with the motorcycle. I mean, the chopper, and uh, picks Get up to the his chopper. <laughs> it's a chopper, baby. And um, who's Zed? How oh, Zed's dead? Oh, great, great, great lines. As that uh, that that chapter uh, wraps up, kind of has and that it... Twilight Zone kind of music going on at the end, right? And also kind of gives you the fake out because doesn't that feel? Zed's dead, baby. Zed's dead. And then they just ride off on the motorcycle. It does feel yeah. like the end of the movie, doesn't it? Yeah, it fe- really feels like, haha, we fucking got you, fam. Um, but then we end up with uh, Jules and Vincent again. And um, this is the divine intervention part where the guy was... We kind of see um, all that go down from another perspective with the guy hiding in the bathroom. Jumps out with the revolver and uh, can't again, hit some- shit. Again, another guy in the bathroom. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and so they go on and on about their divine, the divine intervention, like 
Vincent's really feels like it's a sign, but um, no, no, Jules thinks it's a sign. Vincent thinks it's bullshit. So they have a whole theological debate about that. Um, and he turns the fun- around. He turns around to ask Marvin, mm-hmm. and he has the gun pointed at him, and it blows his head off. So yeah, by actual, far my biggest laugh. The um the actor who plays Marvin, who mm-hmm. some other people might know, I'm pretty sure he was on Mad TV somewhere in the '90s, which is where I remember him from. Okay. Um, Originally, he was going to get shot in the neck, and then they had to shoot him to put him out of his misery. And he suggested that when the gun accidentally goes off, it shoots him in the face and kills him. Because if they have to kill him, it would turn the audience away from pulling for Jules and Vern. Like, mm-hmm. and, and basically vilify them, even though they've just killed, you know, some random guys eating breakfast. Um <laughs> It's just probably one of the more the dark, funny things. Um, one of the darker, funny things you'll see is, yeah, just Jules uh, going to you know casually ask Marvin, and then all of a sudden Marvin's in Vincent. a million pieces. Uh, yeah, Vincent is uh, talking to Marvin and ends up in all those pieces all over the place. So very uh, spastic in how it's put together, and uh, it's it's <laughs> definitely gets a rise out of you and. Um, this is the genius of the Tarantino um, uh, dark comedy. Um, so one thing I literally just thought about, mm-hmm. and so he shoots him. They're in a car. He shoots him in the head. Mm-hmm. And I understand it's a pistol, but he's got a pretty big pistol. When we see the scene after the wolf comes and after they clean up the car and they're looking at it from you, like you're looking at it from the back because they're standing between the, like the wolf's Acura and that car. And he's telling them, Hey, we're going to do this, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. Do you, do you remember, do you remember seeing a bullet hole out the back windshield? Mm, because it no, wouldn't have went in, but I don't think mm. it would have went in the seat because of where Mar- the way Marvin was sitting. Like, I feel like that bullet would have went out that back windshield or at mm. least hit it and cracked it. And I never thought about that until literally just the second I guess it's implied that it's stuck in his head, but it kind of doesn't make sense. So I mean, I guess it's I guess it could be in his head, and they do kind of show his head when they throw the trash bags in there. But mm-hmm. the wolf says we have a body without a head. Okay. He even he even writes Marvin parentheses no head, and then he gets <laughs> there and he's like, so we have a body in a car minus a head. Take me to it. So they mm-hmm. like two times say that he has no head. Mm-hmm. So, but maybe I guess maybe it is supposed to be stuck in what's left of his skull. Mm-hmm. Uh, we meet QT, uh, Quentin as in his little cameo role as Jimmy. Um, his acting is not the best, but I think it has kind of a realistic, like panicked kind of feel to it that I appreciate. The consumer of gourmet coffee. Yeah, I don't care how it tastes. <laughs> I know it tastes good. I'm caring about the. And then, um, yeah, good. You know, I I've always seen the N word here being all about the shock value. You're not expecting to be in this conversation where they're saying these kinds of things, especially about so um, essentially disrespectful towards like Marvin as a human. I mean, they're talking about it as you know just this this thing instead of a person. So um, with that being outrageous and it just being so like kind of in your face over the top it's 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 hard not to be somewhat amused by it even though it's 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 become more and more um you know politically incorrect to uh you know find any uh humor in that i mean like obviously like we no one should be using the word like it's it's a very terrible word and i'm not one who usually is you know like you know, don't be offended by words if you're not offended by them you take the power away from them but that's Mm -hmm. a word that that's especially as, as that word doesn't affect me. It doesn't pertain to me. Right. I've never had it used to disparage me or anything like that. So mm-hmm. like, I can't, I don't think I, you know, I don't have the right to tell somebody, Hey, don't feel offended by this word. That's done nothing but disparage your people in this country and around the world for right. almost 200 years. But you go, you know, we got to think about this movie was written 30 years ago. Mm-hmm. It, was in a different time period. Was it still bad then? Yes, obviously it was still bad. It was still the wrong thing to do. Mm-hmm. But through the lens at which people, you know, in that time period, it 
was not as considered as bad. And I mean, let's be real. Like, like you said, there's humor in that, in that scene, because I mean, you've got this very tight pressure, pressure pack situation where you have these two guys roll up. One of them who is friends with, with Jimmy and the other one, you know, is it, which is Jules. And then you have, um, Vincent with him and, you know, they're trying not to get all the blood all over his, you know, soap and his towels and all of that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Maxi pad. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, they're, they're, of course, you know, Jules is trying to suck up talking about how good the coffee is, you know? Yep. So of, of course, you know, that whole scene where, Hey, when you drove up, did you see this sign? Well, no, yeah. of course not, because this isn't my business. Like, mm -hmm. like, yeah, it's very, it's very shocking. And it is very, um, and he's talking to a black man, um, about that kind of about that topic he's giving him the he's conceding that jimmy's obviously pissed because they showed up with a dead body so he's letting him have this venting moment and being cool about it so there's there's all kinds of little factors in a room I mean, here that make this quite an interesting moment and then there, you can even go so far as you know especially in the the time period we're in the early 90s even though Jules, uh, Jules is this badass. He's a hitman. He, you know, he's in the mm -hmm. mob, whatever. And Jimmy's just a bad motherfucker. Well, Jimmy's just a dude. You know, like he 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 lives at home. He has a nurse for a wife, mm -hmm. but he's he is still white, and he has that power, and he's the one doing Jimmy or jerk. Sam Jimmy's Jackson. Doing, Jimmy's doing them a solid. Is that what you're gonna? Yeah, have? yeah he's doing them a favor. So even though he is saying something very inappropriate and very wrong and very upsetting, like what the fuck is Jules going to do about it? Is Jules going to be like, well, you know, where the fuck out? Well, okay, well now you're screwed. You're yeah. either, you know, they're in the, they're in enemy territory. They said they don't have any friends there or they're going to get rolled by the cops because they've got blood and a dead body in their car. So, you know, he kind of has all the power and can take advantage of that situation, whether or not that was the intention behind that character was that he was taking the power it is just kind of an interesting dynamic to, to think about, mm -hmm. you know, I think more from a now situation, like a, a now perspective versus a then perspective. Um, like I definitely think, you know, if you go and ask Quentin Tarantino, it's there for the shock value. And I mean, and, and supposed to be humor value of, of that phrase. Um, before, you know, you get into the whole cleaning out the car scene, which is also great. Um, and the wolf shows up, and I love how it's it's really that character's really built up as this ultimate uh, cleanup he's guy. The he's the ultimate hombre. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, go in there, chill them people out, and wait for the wolf who will be coming directly. Mm -hmm. Oh, you sending the wolf? You feel better? Shit, homie, that's all you had to say. Like, like you, he, you know, this guy is a legend. And then you see, he's like, it's 30 minutes away. I'll be there in 10. Nine minutes and some change later, he's rolling up in his Acura. It's like, all right, you know, this is Harvey Keitel's a badass. Let's go. Like, yeah, I love that character. He's just like, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. You're going to do that. Vincent giving him some shit about it. He's just like, you know, I don't need to be here. Oh, you don't some kind of, hear all that ambulance nonsense? Yeah, I hear it. What'd you do, Justin? Jeez. <laughs> Jeez, I don't know. I don't know. It's pretty late. Anything could happen. But um yeah, Wolf's great. Um, love how he he's also sucking up to Jimmy. Um, you know, smooth talking him and um kind of being a dick to uh Jules and Vince, but I mean that they got themselves into the situation, so the wolf's doing what they need to do to clean it up. Y'all been you've been to county gentlemen? Strip. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, what do you guys look like? A couple of dorks. Well, they're your clothes. The <laughs> was it the Santa Cruz uh, banana slugs? Yeah, I think it's the urgency of the situation where this the whole Bonnie situation uh, chapter is just has the most spastic, you know, things that come out that just really catch you off guard and just it's, mm. I, I, I still find it amusing. Every time I touch brain, <laughs> I'm the guns of the Navarone. I'm super fly TNT. I'm a mushroom cloud laying motherfucker, motherfucker. Like, oh my God. Oh, you know, obviously right after I'm just saying I'm a race car in the red and you don't push a race car in the red. And it's like, mm -hmm. you're the one who did this. You're the one who shot this guy. <laughs> like, bruh. So I always thought Raquel was Janine Garofalo 
and yeah, that's not the case at all. It's Julia Sweeney, but um, yep. yeah, uh, she's I from she's I'd... from she's from SNL, or she's not a major oh. character on SNL. But I watched oh, enough. Okay. I watched enough SNL reruns on E back in the day that yeah, she mm-hmm. she was on SNL. Was she the one that was Pat? It's Pat. Uh maybe I'd have to go back and check, but I think I think that might be correct. Okay, that's what I recognize her from. And then we go to the final scene. Uh, they're talking all about you know eating pork, and you know that's just a total digression. But yeah, um, we're about- boy, mm-hmm. I that made me think. You talking about you know he's talking about pork and how pork's a filthy animal. It definitely made me think about a line from Hustle and Flow that we'll uh, get to okay. later. Uh, well, see, that's the one I just watched leading into this, so it's a little bit fresher in my memory. But um, oh. it's it, near the end where uh, Terrence Howard and Ludacris are having their conversation, mm-hmm. and he, Ludacris, I'm sorry, Skinny Black asks him something, and he his response is uh is um what is it is um is a pig's pussy pork. <laughs> Oh, right, right. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, oh, shit. <laughs> Brings a whole new definition to uh, porkin'. <laughs> mm-hmm. but bacon and sausage, good. It's a filthy animal. <laughs> um, but yeah, a little you know philosophy conversation there between Jules and uh, Vince. And then he gets into his whole cane walk the earth thing. Vince is uh, kind of putting him down, saying, hey, that's just being a bum. So, um, and there's some truth to that going on adventures i mean dude but like like one is really cool that you know he mentions uh you know another pop culture reference in kane you know mm-hmm. was a 70s tv show but who played kane who played kane in kung fu justin do you know uh build it yes david carradine that is correct and then it all ties in it's the man he is a fucking master um <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, yeah, then the, the finale, you got, you know, Honey Bunny and, um, what's, uh, Pumpkin, right? Yeah, Ringo. Ringo. Yep. Yeah, he caught, uh, because... we finally see them holding up the diner and yeah, runs into the, uh, Vince, the case, no, runs into Jules with the case. Jules definitely wants to, doesn't want to give it to him. You know, they talk some down, um, bitch be cool. It's a pretty thrilling climax. <laughs> Correct, Amundo. The thing that gets me is he tells him to go into the bag and get his wallet. And he's like, mm-hmm. well, which one? And he just so, the way he says it with such conviction of like, motherfucker, you should know which one my wallet is. It's the one that says bad motherfucker. Like, are you stupid? Like, that's kind of just that. Because like, and the other thing here is just so you see these these people, you see Pumpkin and Honey Bunny um, who, you know, they are criminals. They rob people. They're used Mm -hmm. to holding a gun. And so, you know, most people, you know, most common people probably aren't going to want to fuck with them. They got guns. They rob people. And then he run, they, they run into Jules and Vince, especially Jules, who's just cool, calm and collected. He's got a much bigger gun. He's like, like, look, y'all be dead if I fucking wanted you to be dead, but I I don't want you to be dead. So Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you some money until you get the fuck out of here. You're not getting this case. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that's, that's pretty much like what it boils down to is he's like, I'm a bad motherfucker and <laughs> deal. Yeah. And, and it, it's a, it's a great way to complete his arc. Cause you know, he's going on and on about how he wants to be like this, um, not a vigilante, but like a, uh, um, I guess good Samaritan esque kind of thing. Um, yeah. Like Kane Kung Fu. So doing good deeds, good getting in adventures, and so yeah, that's just like the first step in his journey. So pretty awesome how it all comes together. Kind of an anticlimactic ending with their, you know, shoving their guns in their pants and heading out, and then the roll of credits. But I don't think I'd have it any other way. Um, I love this movie. I mean, it's endlessly rewatchable. I've never gotten tired of watching it. Um, there's a couple chapters. I mean, the gold watch and um, me and. Vince going out that if I would say anything, if any of the scenes um, are a little drug out, I mean, I would go with those, but um, still those are a lot of fun to watch. I think drug um, is the optimal word there. (laughs) Oh, I mean, it's a, it's a five easily. It's one of my favorite movies. 
So um, another quick tidbit uh, factoid is so okay. when when they're going after they realize what Butch has done and you see you you see uh, Vincent walking with the bartender Paul. So the bartender Paul actually mm-hmm. auditioned for the role of Jules. Now Tarantino wrote that part for Sam Jackson specifically because of something I don't remember. But that guy auditioned so well that Sam Jackson flew the fuck back out to L.A. to make sure he got that part. And so they gave that guy the the bartender role. And then, you uh-huh. know, it becomes funny. He takes Jules's spot once Jules leaves. But as far as a rating, it, I mean, yes, it's six, seven, eight, nine, whatever the <laughs> fuck you want to give it. It's that's where it is. I mean, it's it's one of my favorite movies now. And obviously, it's not my favorite Tarantino movie. It's probably his best movie i mean some people might argue that it's his masterpiece but um (laughs) i i think i still think kill bill is his best movie but you know it's also my favorite movie so but i mean yes it's a five star like if if, if you and if you were listening to this podcast and you thought you were gonna get anything than two five star reviews for this movie i need you to go back and listen to the more of our podcast um (laughs) Like it's again, it's our fucking logo for crying out loud. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it was so influential. It's it's really seeped its way into pop culture. I mean, so many unforgettable moments throughout it. And I mean, what what else can you say? At Pulp Fiction. It's. Uh, I mean, how how many shirts like just ra- randomly have nothing to do with Pulp Fiction, but use that style of font, that coloration of font. Mm-hmm. It, it's just, I mean, it's. I mean, it's got so many memes. You've seen them where they've replaced um, Jules and Vern with Star Wars characters and just just everything. It is one of the most influential movies of the last, you know, 30 plus years, like right at 30 years. Um, Everybody wants to imitate it and nobody can. I mean, shit, even Quentin couldn't really imitate it again. I mean, like with like Jackie Brown or something, which was supposed to be a different kind of movie. But um which I think yeah. is his most underrated movie. A lot of people sleep on that movie, and I think that movie's fantastic. I think but... that was probably the, the movie I watched after Pulp, and I was expecting more of Pulp in it, and so I was slightly disappointed. But yeah, that movie definitely sp- stands on its own feet in other ways. So, speaking of Pam Greer, another random piece of trivia. So Pam Greer auditioned for the the girl with all the metal in her face. Um Okay. But Quentin did not believe that it was believable that she would get pushed around, you know, having her having played Foxy Brown and coffee and all the strong female characters that she's played. So okay. then he he wrote her character like he wrote Jackie Brown for okay. her. Um, so cool. Yep. All right. We got another movie to talk about after the break. We're going to see if we can make our big break before someone pisses all over our dreams. Right after Main. This. Pork pussy. All right, we are back talking about Hustle and Flow, which is a 2005 American drama from Craig Brewer, produced by John Singleton and Stephanie Alleen. It stars Terrence Howard as Memphis Hustler and Pimp, a Memphis Hustler and Pimp who faces aspirations of becoming a rapper. Also stars Anthony Anderson and Ludacris amongst others so yeah, it um, had a pretty mm-hmm. banging cast i mean taraji p henson yeah. um taryn manning who was an eight mile um in uh orange is the new black and uh a vet which is um anthony anderson wife she was in mm-hmm. scream 2 and a couple of other things but yeah oh yeah okay yeah. cool cool i had seen this one before uh randomly in sweden i think i just Someone had rented it or something, and we put it on, and 
I remember it being a pretty good show. Mm, didn't remember a lot about it, but I did remember the signature thing that happens in the climax. Um, Main. It ended up winning um, Best Song at the Oscars that year. So that was kind of fun to uh, know of this film and then see it win. Um, kind of miss those MTV films, you know. Don't get those anymore. Yeah, I mean, there's probably a whole generation of people who doesn't even know that MTV stands for music television, like that it actually used True. to show music and that was its main thing before it started showing like scream TV shows and whatever the yeah. fuck else it shows nowadays. Like, give me back TRL baby. Let's go. Tracy Shore. <laughs> oh God. That show was a fucking train wreck. And I, it's, and like a train wreck, I could not look away. It was so bad. Holy God. It definitely has a kind of a grimy, sweaty, 70s, blaxploitation aesthetic to it, which um, I definitely p didn't pick up the first time, but now having seen more of that kind of stuff, I mean, especially with um, what Dolomite, um, you kind of pick up on those, those, those sorts of oh, uh, yeah, stylistic and things. That and definitely, you know, it being, you know, them being poor, you know, from a poor area, like in Memphis. Um, yep. Yeah, I think aesthetically this movie is does a very good job of setting uh, setting the scene, you know, using all the visual cues and different things. There's a spot later on where, um, you know, they say the guy, the rapper's name's Al Capone, but it sounds like Lil John, um, which, you know, is a big Atlanta rapper. And, you know, the whole Atlanta rap scene, which I think Ludacris is also from, and thought it was funny that he was playing a Memphis rapper, and then it sounded like another Atlanta rapper was playing a Memphis rapper <laughs> And that they have that sound. And so, they, you know, they brought in that, like, each area in the South or even in the country has its own rap sound. Like, I don't know a ton about rap. Like, I'm not even going to mm -hmm. try to pretend that, you know, I'm a, like a, a rap aficionado or anything. But I do think that that was um, a, an interesting little thing that they did as well to go along with what you were saying, where, you know, it's grimy and it's sweaty. You know, like, that's even mm -hmm. a big thing where um, Taylor okay. McGuire. Uh, like I turned oh, the fan off in the um, their little makeshift studio. Like yeah. I did, it didn't even dawn on me until I was flipping back through the film. I was just like, "Oh, they got." It's not. I at first I thought that was a sound thing, but then I'm like, "No, they're just trying to stay cool in that little closet yeah. thing." Yeah, and and you know, Taryn Manning the whole time is like, "Hey, why can't we go to a hotel? They have air, or like this guy's got this guy's car's got air." They go into that gas station, and she's getting like a um a popsicle to like cool off so yeah no that whole yeah, the whole the movie cooler. is yeah they're definitely grimy and sweaty like throughout the whole movie i definitely appreciated um dj who that's that's uh terrence um his character like it opens up on that close-up of his face and it gradually pulls out and he's kind of doing this kind of sophisticated jibber jabber where you don't even know who's talking to but like you see how he's like being careful about exactly what he says and he's it's really interesting to see the kind of manipulation he throws down and um it's he has a way of manipulating people but he can also empower people and yeah he's um He's a very dynamic character um, that's capable of quite a bit. So uh, it was interesting to see that play out throughout the story. Um, and even, you know, sometimes he's a little bit more withheld, which we'll get to. But, um, yeah, solid camera angles throughout this whole thing. A lot of really good, like, close-up shots. Um, we'll get into, like, the bridge shots later on or just, you know, those look really, really nice. Um, I was looking back through... Uh, Jim Brewer was the, the director and writer of this one. Um, oh, Craig Brewer. Um, he also did a Black Snake Moan, which I can definitely see the aesthetic being similar there. Did you ever get around to that one? It's been a long time since I've seen that one, but I remember it being, you know, being a good movie outside of, you know, Christina Ricci being naked the whole time. Um, <laughs> because, I mean, let's be real, she is naked, like, the whole movie. Um but yeah, no, it's been a long time and I have to rewatch it to be able to like make it to like a comparison between the two. But I do remember it being a, like a, a, a good movie and like having a powerful message and meaning and stuff to it besides her, her being naked the whole time. Yeah, Terrence Howard, he just commands this performance so well from his ability to be convincing as a rapper to convincing as a drug dealer, convincing as a pimp. He just he just owns this role so well and does that each of these these facets of the character um, pretty much to perfection. 
as we see uh, the story go along. And then he gets the little, uh, he gets the keyboard main from a guy who wants some drugs main. And you know, it, yeah, it's, he's not happy it, about him knocking on his uh, car door at first either. <laughs> he's yeah, like, no, he's, he's, he's about to bust that guy up main. I mean, they're from the main. Memphis, what, um, ghetto. So, I mean, he's always got to be on his toes about who's, you know, banging on his car window. Yeah, sure. but uh, he was pretty excited, I guess, to get that keyboard back, main, and that's what uh, re reignited his love for music, main. Yeah, main. Um, yeah, main. <laughs> Not man, main. M A I N, main. <laughs> um, that's the new drinking game, by the way. If you want to die while watching a movie, every mm-hmm. time Terrence Howard says man, um, but in that tw- country twang that makes it sound like he's saying main, mm-hmm. take a drink. Uh, okay. About 10, 10 to 15 minutes into this movie, you'll be flat out past the fuck out. Just saying. <laughs> um, they don't really spill out the relationship he has with all the girls in his house. Um, I, like, I thought the two were just strippers and then Nola was the uh, prostitute. But according to Wiki, they all are prostitutes. And the two, he allows the two to strip. Very, uh, very possessive over... The crowd in his house but i mean they're dependent on him right yes yeah, so um so it's nola suge mm-hmm. and, and Lex. lexus mm-hmm. yeah lexus so suge is pregnant and they even say that she's she's just a trick that's knocked up by a random john but you know you can tell that he cares for her and he cares oh, yeah. for nola mm-hmm. um but he doesn't seem to really give a fuck about lexus as we see later on um like well, her demeanor story. is a lot more aggressive, which doesn't fly well with him. Oh, yeah. I mean, she basically is like, hey, fucking do something. And he does it. And she's like, what? <laughs> and um, so, you know, I think he definitely he cares for Nola and Suge. And Suge definitely, as we'll go into, becomes romantic. But Nola is like is like his business partner, his best friend or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um and you know, it's just a very interesting dynamic he has with all of them because you'll see him, you know, be with Nola and be like, bitch, go over there and, you know, fuck this guy. But then, you know, he'll be like, hey, you know, I care about you and let's do this for you or blah, blah, blah. So it's just, you know, it's an interesting dynamic. And I guess, you know, some of that is also like gaslighting or whatever you want to call it, where he's sure. super, you know, super controlling, but then, you know, gives them a small morsel of compassion or affection and, you know, mm-hmm. it makes them stay. But I guess also, you know, you see throughout the movie, they're kind of all stuck. Like he, they're, they're in this spot because it's whatever circumstances have brought them there, but they've got to work together and they do um, to, you know, try to get th- do their best to get out of it. Um, pretty tender moment there where they hand him um, Alexis's kid and, He's having a little moment with the kid on the the keyboard. They're playing around, but then at the same time, there's like these these drug scales around. So definitely not an ideal uh, family atmosphere. As you know, that 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 theme kind of comes up throughout. Um, but yeah, he's a great smooth talking hustler. As I was going on and on about Anthony Anderson being in this movie is quite a breath of fresh air because he had such a different kind of character into the mix here compared to these. Uh, these more um, living, you know, trick by trick uh, crowd, I guess you could yeah, say. Yeah, I, I think Andy Anthony Anderson is like a very underrated actor. So you know, most a lot of people I think know him for some more of his more mainstream like comedies and stuff, and he usually plays a more straight laced character. But then if you've ever seen The Shield, he plays one of the biggest bad guys in the whole series, and he's oh, wow. a fucking badass gangster in that show, like. Do you want to talk about a show that has some, some, some good bad guys? I mean, it has um, Anthony Anderson plays a bad guy in one season. You had another season where the bad guy is um, the Last King of Scotland. Um, oh, um, Forrest, Forrest Whitaker. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I mean, they've had some not to, to to stray too far away, but yeah. No, Anthony Anderson, I think, is very underrated. Um, pretty much any time you see him in something, he is going to play that role fucking brilliantly. So, you know, in, in this, it was a, he was, he was the person that was better off that extended like a branch, you know, to, to help 
these people where a lot of people probably wouldn't. They would have just said, oh, he's a pimp. They're hookers, strippers, whatever. And he was like, you know what? This, you know, he is trying to do something and I'm going to help him for better or worse. Yeah, well said. Um, I love the uh, the operatic uh, church song moment where, you know, they come, Nola and um, DJ come and check out his, his operation and they they got those big uh, single tier moments. I think there's two of them throughout this thing, but I mean, they're a little cheesy, but um, at the same time, it, it gets the in intent across. All right, so we got the scene of, um, let's see, per Oh, that's whenever I that is his name Key. Um, yeah, his so he had another name, but like his producer name or his street name or what they called him in school was Key because his name oh, was. Okay. I I don't think it was Clarence, but it it was something similar to that. Let's see if I can find it real quick. Essentially, I was just appreciating the fact that um, there's there's this whole dynamic between him and his his wife and his wife is you know definitely more of an upper class lady she's you know runs a pretty tight home um gets dinner prepared for him you know at on time but he's having to kind of um go away from his comfort zone with her in order to help dj um which she comes to appreciate so that's a real that's kind of a, a subplot that i think that plays out pretty nicely is the fact that um Anthony or uh, Key doesn't mind, you know, I mean, he, he's he's convinced with DJ's ability and slips back into this, um, you know, hanging out with, you know, less desirable people. But for, you know, because he sees potential um, with what DJ has. And then, um, you know, his wife has to just kind of come around to that. And it's kind of sweet to see see that happen. Oh, yeah. No, I definitely thought that that was going to be like this big rift. Um, and, and like, you know, that was going to cause problems that may seep into, you know, their music career. And I was kind of expecting to, he, it gets a rift between him and his wife, which, you know, he has to go and fix and slows down the music, but I was glad they didn't go in there. And I was glad to see that, like, she realized like he wasn't like going over there just to be with them hoes. Like he was over there and they were, you know, trying to, to, yeah, trying to do something and then to see her see him be happy uh -huh. in that role and see that he was good at it. And that, you know, she was genuinely happy about it. Like that is not something you typically see in a lot of movies, especially in a movie like this, where so much is there's so much like destitution or, and, and like uh, poverty and that kind of stuff. Also mm -hmm. uh, both IMDB and letterbox just have him as key, but I could have swore she called him by like his full name. Mm -hmm. but I don't remember what it is. We can, we um, keep getting the vibe that Lexus is uh, continuing to be unpleasant to be around. So that builds up to, um, yeah, him kicking her out of the house. Cause yeah, she's all up in his face and he doesn't have any problem doing it. I mean, it's a pretty emotional moment. You know, he kind of grabs her by the neck there. It's like, what's um, he going to do? But um, he kind of, it was also um, mm -hmm. a, another scene to harken back to, to Pulp Fiction of okay. exploding violence. Yeah. Just, you know, just, it just explodes into violence and it kind of happens again in the, um, at the, the, the culmination of the end of the movie too. We'll yeah, get to that bathroom. in a bit, but mm -hmm. yeah, but it's just, it goes from, you know, just, a you know, cause there's not really like a lot of violence. There's a lot of insinuated violence and talked about violence, there's not a lot oh, of yeah. actual violence until there is. And yeah, that scene is definitely the end. that scene between Lexus and, and DJ, like you've got you've got Nola crying, you've got Suge crying, you've got mm -hmm. the baby crying, and then Lexus is just, you know, like, fuck you, you're a bitch, you're not a man, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, I kinda thought if he grabs her, I thought he was gonna beat the shit out of her. Like I'm not even gonna front. And then mm -hmm. he, you know, he throws her out, he he busts the crib up, and then he just picks the baby up in the walker and sets her down on the porch and then, you know, or sets him down on the porch and Lexus is like, where am I supposed to go? And he's like, um, something like, not my concern you go, anymore. Like you can go to hell for all the fuck I off for all the fucks I give yeah. or something like that. It was like, just like, damn dude. And you don't really see her anymore until like 
the very end of the movie. Yeah. Um, then you have DJ Qualls, uh, which I mostly remember him from, uh, what was it, Road Trip, um, you know, where he's hooking up with the, the, the big lady. Um, but yeah, it's interesting seeing him in there, but he, it works really well. Um, he's very light skinned. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, do you know he's not black? He's like, yeah, just light skinned. So it's, that's kind of a fun nod there to kind of a more of a geeky looking guy, you know, getting invited into the, the, the circle and, here and it works yeah, well in the movie. Cause yeah, he always plays like the dorky nerdy kind of guy. And in here, you know, like he's the, he's a fucking DJ producer. Like he's got these, these, these skills and yeah, I guess he installs, you know, he, he works on, um, he's very encouraging too. And he's, he's very calm and collected. He's just like, all right, you know, don't get high. You know, just do your, do, do you, let's hear what you are. Okay. Now we can chill. And yeah. yeah he, and, and I, I thought they were going to like put some sort of uh love angle between him and Nola. Yeah. It definitely, because even they, they were, out of that, for sure. Yeah. Where they're sitting on the car and talking and then it kind of, it just kind of goes away. Like, I, and I don't know if it was something that they cut or it was supposed to just be, she for once was just hanging out chilling and, you know, wasn't worried about having to bone mm-hmm. every guy that she saw. So like, I, I don't know. Um, I like how they really struggle to get him to understand what kind of music is going to be going to make him a star going to actually get played on the radio. Cause he's all into these, these riffs where he's beating and stomping hoes and stuff. And, Finally, they find that uh, "whoop that trick" is the uh, the cat is the little uh, saying that they can yeah, work whoop, with. But "whoop that trick" like it's still that's still. Mm, I mean, the trick's a hoe, and "whoop that trick." So no, it's well, still, it's, well, a trick is a um, isn't actually a hoe. You know, working with a customer, so she's she's kicking that you know that that job's ass is kind of how I took it. They're whooping okay. that trick. I mean, I still don't think it's great, but yeah, I think it's better than just beat that hoe. <laughs> beat that? Yeah, that, I don't think it. I'm not sure who wants to listen to that. And then, Boy. um, yo, when they got when they got to Suge recording, boy, that was some. Mm-hmm. That's some good shit. They did. I, I don't know. Like, obviously, you know, what recording typically looks like, especially in your like in a makeshift recording studio but um right like i felt like they put a lot of emphasis on that and you know doing the oh, sure. the, the poor man soundproofing which that is a thing i heard i definitely talked to a buddy of mine when i was in my old condo and was and you know was wanting to to soundproof because you know i'm sure you remember we had the hardwood floors we could kind of hear anything and everything coming from the other room right especially the bottle of kraken that you know sounded like a gunshot that night um Oh yeah, but you know, I was talking to one of my buddies, and he's like, "Yeah, he's like, if you got to, you, know, you just use like egg cartons, or in that case, drink holders, and mm-hmm. you know, it'll it'll mostly soundproof." So, um, luckily, I didn't end up not having to do that. Um, well, I have this gizmo. Like, I've done a lot of like education like videos, and like the software I use gets very echoey. So, the more like. I can capture that sound in it. It sounds a lot better. So yeah, I have a fair amount of experience trying to uh, make the best sound possible. Um, the music creation process, by far my favorite part of the movie. Um, I mean, it falls in line with like films like Amadeus, where you really get into the creation process of music, and it's it's really neat to see that all come together because it it it's done really well here. Um, as they lay down the beats and get the rap going and you got to figure out what the hook is and, um, and, and then, you know, record the hook multiple times and then they take it and they play with it. And then, uh-huh. you know, laying, laying the lyrics down and, and, and all of that. No, it's very interesting because, you know, like I remember being a kid and, you know, I was in, and, and still am, but I was always into rock music and, you know, the, so that of course the dream is to be a rock star. And so you think you, you know, you can just go pick up a guitar and, you know, Sure. slam a riff or you can be a singer and you just sing but it's 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 more than that it's more than i will ever know because i can't sing and i can't play guitar you know and obviously anything that's shown in a movie is going to be movie-fied some like obviously i imagine a lot of that was as close as they could probably get it to someone you know doing that out of their you know house you mm-hmm. know so 
Um, love those bridge shots. And then they show the close up of his face when he basically is um, about to get ready for what he needs to do with laying a solid track down. Um, yeah. Um, Henson and Shug is just a delight in this movie. It's so sweet when she brings them a lava lamp and she later buys him like a, um, a chain. Just it's a really sweet. Um, so, so they're struggling to like pay the rent and the bills. Where the hell she get the money for the lava lamp and that chain? I guess she whooped that trick. I don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe she was, um, she was running some mouth tricks, you know, she was super preggers, but I don't know. It just, it was something I was like, man, where the fuck she get all this money from? Like the lava lamp. All right. Maybe you got 30 bucks laying around, but a chain, mm -hmm. like where, where the fuck she get that? Good contrast to what Lexus is bringing to the, the house, um, you know, before she gets the boot. But, um, yeah, like I, I'd echo what you said about how Suge, like at first she's kind of uneasy about saying and then she finds a rhythm and then like like Terrence um, or DJ uh, pushes her and just like let it out. And then you can kind of hear like the sexuality in her voice. And oh, it's 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 really cool how it um it enhances each time she sings it. And, and they brought kind of that like old, old style, like Motown R&B to even though it's these, you know, lyrics about uh, bitches leaving because of Cadillacs or whatever mm -hmm. where it is. But it had that 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 mo more modern lyrics with that older style sound, which was a very interesting contrast. OK, um, I appreciated how like their mics were just no good. So they have to go to a pawn shop to pick up some good mics. Um, and that's the scene that you had mentioned before where um, Nola essentially gets hustled in order to get him the, the mics and she does not want to play that game. I'm not really sure how that's different than hanging out, you know, pulling tricks all day, but I guess it's just the approach to it. Like I just mean, yeah, assuming that you can use her as collateral. Yeah, because she said you have to, she, you know, I mean, I guess you even see it earlier, you know, when that one guy drives by and at first she's not into it and then he drives by again and she's like, she you know, Hey, let me show you me walking over here with these heels or whatever. Like, mm -hmm. I guess maybe it's cause he didn't consult her, you know, at least if she's out tricking, like that's what she's there for. And maybe they, she just thought they were out, you know, trying to buy these mics and maybe mm -hmm. he'd went over there and talked to her, but then that doesn't go into the, into how he sold it. You know, he's like, you know, she's mine, but she don't belong to me. Like, yeah, I like his like, smooth talking like hinting around what he's talking about but not directly saying it but being obvious enough about it to where you know the, 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 they're picking up on it too so yeah it's a very very well written character um some of the stylistic elements i liked how like he pretends to know skinny black and whenever he's like you know saying these lies um we kind of see these montage footage of you know when he's dropping like these references to him you know sticking with this lie which um it's kind of an interesting touch well yeah we didn't we went to the we didn't go to the same school but you know like yeah he know me and it's like does he really and then you find out that they don't yeah and he's uh he's actually pretty uh he, get, he gets stiffened right up whenever he's dressing up and he's putting that nice jacket on and stuff he's he's kind of scared to go into the you know the lion's den to talk to skinny and um Gosh, then we get that great kiss whenever, you know, he's really show, showing his um his love for Suge for, you know, her kindness towards him and god, that's a it's a very sexy kiss they give. It's very it's also very emotional and you can feel mm -hmm. like that you, you know, so you see that, you know, you, you cuz cuz you don't really know their dynamic other than she's a she's pregnant and obviously was one of his hoes. You know yeah. the dynamic between him and Nola you don't really know their dynamic and then you see she's like oh well you know i saw this in all these rap videos or these people producing so here's this and you know it's like this really sweet gesture and then she gets the chain and you're like all right maybe something's more than mm -hmm. like and then you know then they have the big the big smooch so it's like okay and then um, whenever he goes to talk to Skinny, a very careful hustle, trying to relate to him, admire him, but also be strong and kind of challenge him. Did and, you recognize um, the bartender or the owner of the bar? Um, I did recognize him, but uh, what, are you, what are you getting at? I just, you had mentioned... He's from a commercial, isn't he? Oh, that's Isaac Hayes. 
Right. What's he famous for again? Uh, To most people in our generation for being Chef from South Park. Oh, okay, okay. But um, I'm pretty sure he's a pretty big music uh, guy from back in the day. Okay. Um, Let's see. Before I speak incorrectly. And this note kind of goes throughout the movie, but um, definitely want to mention the effective use of close-ups. Captures that Memphis heat, sweat, like we had mentioned before. Yeah, he was one of the creative forces behind Southern Soul Music label Stacks Records. Hmm. Um, him and David Porter were inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame in 05. And then he was into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He mm-hmm. wrote Soul Man. So, yeah, no, he's a, he's a big, big music guy. BFD. Oh. Uh, he wrote the score for the Shaft film from 1971. That's a new criterion, too. And he won uh, the Oscar for Best Original Song in 72. Oh. Third third black person to win an Oscar. Sweet. Yeah. So, anyway, yeah. sorry to random, you know. random tangent, but I mean, like I said, most people know him for my my salty, sweaty balls oh, from, our, from our age. Mm-hmm. And so DJ goes into the bathroom. He's about to head out. He thinks he's sco- he uh, him and a uh, skinny hit it off, and he's gonna listen to his tape, even though Skinny's just like, "How am I even gonna play this?" But uh, man, Skinny throws it in the toilet. I this is the one like the big thing about the movie I actually did remember was the fact that he threw it in the toilet. So, uh, so did, you, I, did, I, did you see it coming? I didn't know that, but I was like, because he said, "Hey, I'm gonna go to the bathroom." And I was like, man, he's going to throw that tape away. And then when DJ was like, hey, I'm going to go take a piss, I was like, oh, there's about – something's about to go down. I didn't know it was that, mm-hmm. but I knew that I, – I said audibly he threw he threw it in the trash. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, it wasn't quite right, but, I mean, he threw it worse than the trash, I guess. He threw it in the toilet. So, And not only did he throw it in the toilet, he, while being that crossfaded, had the ability to pull the all of the tape itself out and then throw it in the toilet. Yeah, insult to injury. Um, and then it kind of stems back to the fact that, yeah, this is kind of taking part in kind of a more crime-ridden area as, um, you know, the violence kind of erupts between him and Skinny. And uh, he ends up getting the reputation that he, he he beat up Skinny Black, which is good for his uh, rep as a, as a rapper. Um, there's shots so, fired. Oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah. So... Um... Yeah, so he 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 you know is beating the shit out of Skinny, and his mm-hmm. bodyguard walks in, sees that he's got the gun that he knocked away from Skinny, shoots the bodyguard, holds him hostage till he gets out of there. Mm-hmm. But then he's talking to Anthony Anderson in jail, and he's like, "You got some time," and he's like, "For you, I got eleven months." The bitch got a year for aggravated assault, assault with a deadly weapon, attempted murder potentially, like. I feel like he would have been in jail a lot longer than 11 months. I guess we mm-hmm. don't know the, the full time in between him getting arrested and being in jail, but it seems like he was already sentenced. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that seems like a very short uh, sentence for the, the, the crimes that he had. Sure. I could see that. <sighs> but um. Yeah, definitely empowers Nola before he uh, gets uh, sent off to jail. Um, that you know, it's all in your hands now. We, uh, you know, we you're, laid you're it down. You're in charge, yeah. Mm-hmm. As management, and yeah, she goes and works and gets it, gets them on the radio, and they have their big moment where they're celebrating. Like I said, he has the repu- reputation of beating up Skinny Black, so that's going for him. And we get the end scene where the even the cops are just like, "Hey, we're we want to be in the rap game," and. At this point, he's pretty humble about it, and he's just like, "Well, everyone's gonna have a dream." Pretty good movie, Joey. Yeah, it was, it was good. Um, and I remember it being a big deal from back in the day. And I remember the "It's Hard Out Here for a Pimp" song being big and winning the Oscar. But you know, it was one of those movies that was always on my list to watch, and I just never did until now. Mm-hmm. So, um, I'm in between four and four and a half. I think I would stick four just because. It's a really good movie, but there, you know, it, I, I wouldn't say I would necessarily get like real excited watching it. Um, although those music scenes are really, really good. 
So yeah, kind of bouncing between four and four and a half. Um, we'll see where I end up with my review. Um, I put it at three and a half, but even when I did that, I was like, it's somewhere between a three and a half and a four. Like if I could maybe give it like a three, seven, five, that'd probably be what I would do. Like it's, it's very good and it does what it wants to do very well. Um, and I think it represents, you know, that, um, urban, you know, struggling poverty, trying to get out any way you can. I think it has a good representation of that or as much as I could imagine that would be a good representation um so without yeah, really beating a, in it without it doesn't beat you over the head with that either i mean they're in the situation you can see the situation they're in and they're obviously trying to get out of it but um it's not like making it's not making a sob story around it either yeah yeah there's no like every time you turn around in dialogue the we're trying to get the fuck out of here kind of thing like or there's not like that scene like they're watching the news and they find out like a whole like family died from like a drive-by or something like extreme like that it, the the violence doesn't really break until you know that big moment at the end and i think you know you could you could have made a movie that would have been more about the violence like that with the drive-bys and stuff but it mm -hmm. couldn't have been th it couldn't have been that movie like that doesn't fit in that movie. Those kind of movies have their place and tell their story, and mm -hmm. I'm okay with that. Like Boys too, in the Hood it, or something. Yeah, but it just it wouldn't have been this movie. And this movie, I think I think this was a very good movie, and I think you know the accolades and stuff that it did, it got it definitely deserved. And um, you know Terrence Howard really shined um as DJ Maine. Cool, cool. All right, let's where we, where are we going next? All right, we're gonna throw it back. Okay. Uh, so I'm picking from your category of a favorite movie of mine that you have not seen. Correct? Yes. So this was a little bit tricky. Um, you had seen a good amount of my movies. Um, that I kind of wanted to pick, like off the cut. Uh, Point Break. Obviously, I couldn't pick Kill Bill. I can't pick Old Boy. I can't pick La La Land. So I kind of had to dig around a little bit. I had uh, three movies um, that kind of stuck out. So okay. the the first one um, you had seen, but you had not um, reviewed. Reviewed, which was Kick Ass, okay. um, which I very much love, and I decided to pass on that. The other one was The Babysitter. Um, which is a Netflix horror comedy, which I absolutely love. Um, Kidman, right? No, that's um, uh, Samara Weaving. Oh, okay. Samara Weaving, Bella Thorne. Um, and then the, the the one that I decided to stick back to, we're going to throw back to episode three, where um, I had challenged you in episode two to watch The Raid, and you kind of alluded to it at the very beginning. Um, we're going to come full circle and do a sequel to a movie we watched on the cast, baby. We're going to do The Raid 2. <laughs> and what threw me over the top is I was sitting there, you know, talking, kind of talking about it with Carl and trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And, you know, your how your memories show up on Facebook. Um, mm -hmm. It was like nine years ago today, which wasn't today. It was a couple of days ago, but it was nine years ago today was where I went and saw The Raid 2 in theater. And I was like, all right, oh. well gotta gotta go pick it so yeah. um the, still haven't the, seen it so <laughs> boy let's go we're gonna do uh another very violent film to go with pulp fiction <laughs> cool cool all right random number generator between I think one and 43 yeah 43 all right let's see boop, 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 boop. okay generate number <laughs> shut up it's not I'm, it's giving me 43, but that's bullshit. Let me do it again. 10, okay. 10 is Dead Man Walking. I have been putting this movie off forever. Okay, Dead Man Walking is directed by Tim Robbins, a justice drama based on a true story about a man on death row, um, starring Susan Sarandon and Sean Penn. I'm excited. Okay, interesting. All right, in my category to you, okay, we're gonna keep the theme of throwing it back. We're now we're not necessarily gonna throw it back to something we've already did, mm -hmm. but we're gonna throw it back to the year 1985. Okay. Any movie from 1985 that you and Ooh. I both have not seen? 
okay, okay. Which you have neither one of us have seen very many movies from '85. I've seen, I think it was 15, really? and I think you would, I think you had seen like 35 or something. It was not very many for each of us. So it should not be that hard to find a movie that is interesting that we both have not seen. Okay. Um, unless you really have a hankering for something that, you know, one of us hasn't seen, but preferably something that we both haven't seen. Obviously I'll have to go in and do a little analysis on the big movies that year compared to what you've seen. Let me run down a few that I haven't seen. Ooh, it's a good year. Back to the Future. Um, let's see here. Uh, da, 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 da. Haven't seen Fright Night. That's cool. Angel's Egg. That's a short, though. Well, that's a, I think that's like 45 minutes. Um, I've never seen Return of the Living Dead. Phenomena by, um, what is that, uh, the uh, Italian guy. Um... Uh, that doesn't really narrow it down. <laughs> sure it does. Uh, Dario Argento. <laughs> oh, Sorry. Argento, yeah. That, that specific <laughs> Italian guy, yes. Oh, man. I have seen Commando. haven't seen Room with a View. Um, never seen The Purple Rose of Cairo. That's a, that's a uh, uh, Woody Allen. Um, live and Die in L.A. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of interesting choices here. Ooh. Yeah. Wow. Any favorites um, from me? I mean, I, I really I like, I, I mean, I obviously like um, Back to the Future, but I don't remember. Well, we've, we've, both, we've both seen that, right? Yes, we have both seen that. So. <laughs> okay. Um, so I said 2008 earlier, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, so 2008, those movies, since I didn't have them off the cut earlier, were Rock and Roll Up, Tokyo Gore Police, Shay, Shay, Forgetting Sarah Marshall, In Bruges, and Gomorra. Okay. So, a very eclectic group there. Only 15 films you've seen. Oh, I've never seen Teen Wolf, but you have. So, if, if it's something that you're interested in, and I've seen it, but you haven't, that's fine. Or vice versa, where you've seen it, but I haven't, and you're like, you know what, this motherfucker needs to watch it, that's fine too. <laughs> Whatever. Right. I mean, hell, this is just 1985. Whatever you, you want, 1985. Just go. The year the year of our birth. <laughs> cool, cool. All right. Well, thanks for hearing us ramble on about Hustle and Flow and Pulp Fiction. Um, if you have any comments for us, uh, we'd love to hear about it. How they do that, Joey? Um, all sorts of ways. So <laughs> the main way is the Average Joe's Movie Clubcast at gmail.com. You can still hit up our Facebook page. Leave us comments there. You can find us at our personal letterboxes, which is um, mine is Joey underscore or letterbox.com slash Joey underscore P. Yours is letterbox.com Peterson. I don't know your your your. Just search fucking... Justin Peterson on Letterbox. Um... Yeah, you'll find it. Um, you can hit me up at Twitter at uh, at the or the underscore average underscore Joe underscore E. Um, no, no the just average underscore Joe underscore E. Or you can hit us at the A M G A J M C C. Um. <laughs> You look for Lucas. my handle in the, in the uh, description for the video. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's just, it's late. It's like, I'm usually asleep by now. I'm running off of just pure caffeine. I apologize. But um, we do want to hear from you. Um, I do want to say thanks to the people who did the poll on Twitter a couple weeks ago um, for Schlock Talk. And that episode is out now. Um, and hopefully we're going to do um, a little bit more stuff on Twitter Um and uh, you know so be on the lookout for that and be on the lookout i know we mentioned earlier that we switched to anchor um and hopefully that means that there's been a few episodes that we got behind on getting onto spotify and stuff um i've got a few of them up and hopefully in the next week or so you will see the rest of them so if you haven't been able to check them out because you listen on spotify 
we will hopefully have all of that um, corrected soon and hopefully won't have that issue again going forward. Cool, cool. All right, Justin. So as always, brother, why do we do this show? Because you're a bad motherfucker. Because <laughs> we love talking about movies. you Night. goddamn right I'm a bad motherfucker. <laughs> Check us out next time. We'll be talking Raid 2 and uh, Dead Man Walking. Dead Man right? Walking, yeah, yeah. Something like that. Something that seems very contrasting to one another. So that's, uh, that's how we live our life. All right. Bye, everybody. Laters. Just my, 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 my.